Fantastic. Uh, hello. Well, I will start on my preamble and uh, do sort of welcomes. And then if people sort of come in halfway through that, then uh, that's not too much of a problem. So hello and welcome to Intermediate our training. Uh, my name is Simon Willisley Miller. I'm a senior analytical manager for NHS England and a fellow of the NHSR community. So we're going to be doing using our studio cloud for our training today, uh, just so we're all working from the, the same version and we don't have to sort of fight any sort of local IT issues and all of that malarkey. Um, so while I'm just doing this rabbit -y, intro y bit, if you would very kindly, uh, I've just put the link in the chat there, if you could just log into uh, Posit Cloud. Um, if you haven't got an account already, you can just link it up to your uh, Google account, or if you, sorry, if you have got a, a Google account, you can link it to that. If you haven't, you can just use whatever email address you want. It is free and all of those good things. So just make sure you've got access to that. That would be a great start. Um, as I said, this is an intermediate course. Uh, it's been designed by me and I've run it a couple of times and made a few tweaks uh, here and there on the way. I'll be asking for feedback at the end. So please be honest, um, just so that, you know, we could tweak it for, for sort of any future iterations. A uh, bit about me. I've been working in data and analytics now for uh, 15 years, I think. Something crazy like that. Um, across sort of health, social care, and a little stint working for the police. Um, very much came from sort of a, a pure sort of Excel background, um, especially within my sort of social care days, where we would literally use something called business objects to download individual tables of, of child protection data and do V lookups uh, across everything. So the entire database was only about 8,000 children. So that was like the, you know, select star from star, you'd only get like 8,000 children. Um, and then we would do V lookups on every single thing. So I'd get my list of children. If I wanted to know their ethnicity, I'd download the entire ethnicity table pop it into a sheet in Excel and then do a V lookup. And then if I wanted to get their gender, I would download the entire gender table and then do a V lookup on that. So everything was just this just crazy V lookup process. We used to report uh, quarterly, a quarter in arrears, uh, because that's how long it took to do these absolutely bonkers, crazy manual Excel processes. So if you ever hear me now talking about Excel and with a with an absolute hate um that's that's probably why um so i've uh um where are I? i'm in interesting england now i've been using r for about four or five years now prior to that i did use sort of sql and sort of various other bits um so yeah first time i saw code and what oh my goodness me we can use sql to do this rather than excel uh that was just a little bit mind-blowing so yeah i've been using r for about four or five years now um i guess my how that sort of started was my provider star trust wanted to um adopt sort of spc and our integrated performance reports and basically we wanted to work out how we could do that at scale uh rather than using uh, the lovely making data account but very shonky excel data tool so as uh we we started using sort of spc within our there and i was also fortunate enough to be involved with our local medical school where they were looking into sort of more operational research projects and uh got kind of interested in that area and i was really really fortunate to get onto the second iteration of the hsma program uh for those that have heard of it if not i'll post the link later and that really sort of fueled my love for sort of data science and operational research and recently undertook a, a master's in healthcare data science which i completed about a year and a bit ago um so r allowed me to automate all that board reporting auto or got me interested into sort of using more robust uh, stats and, and data science. Um, I currently work across two teams. So I work in the, the Southwest Intelligence and Insights team, uh, which is more of a performance focus. And I also work in the National Elective Recovery team where I do a bit more data science-y stuff. Um, but I'm also really personally keen to get more of the sort of data science and performance sort of smushed together a little bit more and sort of grey those barriers. Um, and I think there's, you know, much, much more sort of robust stuff we can do with that sort of performance reporting to, to get more insight out of it. Um, so uh, R's a great tool, which allows you to do that. Um, 
so you know it could do all that grunt work of data wrangling and then also sort of produce some beautiful visuals and then you know we can go into that whole markdown and quarto and do full lovely outputs etc um and you know then if you do want to go down that sort of data science and, and stats routes it's all in that same framework so love love a bit of that um, today we are going to be focusing on the grunt work of, of data wrangling um but you know, be aware. Like I say, what you learn today can be adapted and, and used for sort of other bits and pieces. Um, there are other resources around around sort of more visualization focus or markdown and quarto, and I'll share some of those at the end. But you know, we are going to be doing a lot of the, the grunt grunty wrangling today. Um, I'm also assisted today by the uh, wonderful Anya. If uh, if you'd be so kind to say hello and do a quick intro. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm Anya Ferguson. I'm a healthcare analyst in the strategy unit. I recently joined it, I think it was January this year. Um, before then, I was a information analyst at a trust. So we're doing a lot of the routine reporting and like Simon, it was a lot of Excel, you know, lots of pivot tables, moving data physically between SQL and Excel, then putting it into an email or into a template or whatever. Um, at during that time, I did a lot of, I automated a lot of that, so created lots of functions, which I think we're going to talk about later on today. Um, so, yeah, that's that's me. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So not as a icebreaker, I don't think we've got time to go around everybody, but just so we can sort of judge where you are, uh, would you just kindly pop into chat your, your job title, where you work, how long you've been using R, and what your favourite Pokemon is? Also, let me know if anybody's got any sort of specific lunchtime requirements so that we can sort of try to judge uh, when, when to do lunch. And while you're doing that, I'll go through the very, very basic ground rules of the day. Um, so I will be going quite fast and I do talk a lot. Uh, you all absolutely have a free pass to say at any time, Simon, stop waffling, Simon, shut up. Um, if I go off on a tangent or or if you just say, want to say, Simon, stop, and uh, you want to ask a clarifying question. So, you know, do feel free just to shout at me. You absolutely no problem. Um, I will do my best to go at a pace where you can keep up. Um, but if I do zoom past an exercise too fast, then like I said, do shout at me. It's not like the old days where I could sort of, you know, pace the room and see where everybody is. It's it's very hard to sort of judge uh, what's going on. So, you know, we, we will go how see how that works. So the format today, uh, in a minute, we're going to sort of open up a script and we will work through it together. Um, there's a number of things in there which we will simply run and have a look at the results. And then following on from that, there will be some specific sections where it will be over to you to do like a mini code uh, exercise based on what we've just done. Um, I'm sure you've all heard the phrase, uh, you learn from your mistakes. So absolutely believe in that. Anyone who makes a mistake, um, you know, let's embrace that as a wonderful opportunity that that person has made for us to uh, sit around and, and learn from them. So Let's share screens, see what you've done and see if we can unpick it together. So please don't just suffer in silence. Like I say, it's, it's a learning opportunity for us all to see what you've done. And, and, you know, we can all then try to hone in and work out where the commas missing or your brackets are not quite right or, or whatever. So, you know, please, please do not suffer in silence. Uh, there are no silly questions, but I can't guarantee you won't get stupid answers. Um, but like I said, do please ask questions. I'd rather you spoke them um, just because it's uh, much easier to be documented on the recording uh, rather than um, in, in the chat, which I think gets lost from the recording. So um, sometimes if I'm answering a question that's in the chat, it's very one-sided because I won't necessarily read the question loud and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we will take breaks here and there if like uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Like I say, if anybody has got any specific lunchtime stuff, please, please let us know and I'll have a look in our sort of uh, first morning break. Um, like I said, we'll probably take a break every sort of hour and a half, something like that. But, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, if anybody is desperate, <laughs> you know, likewise, do shout. The course is scheduled until 4.30, uh, but I think you've pretty much got me as long as you need me. Um, if there's time at the end, happy to go back over stuff or to expand or, or, or whatever. Um, cannot stress this enough. Uh, the most important bit, you know, this is your day to learn. Um, so, you know, absolutely treat yourself with the respect that you deserve. 
and give your attention to the training. So, you know, it's your day, it's your training. So just try to switch off teams, try not to overreact if your house is on fire or anything else. You know, this is all about you and your training. And, you know, that's the important bit today. Actually, if your house is on fire, then all right, maybe we'll, we'll sort that out. Okay, so hopefully uh, people are chucking stuff into the chat, which is great. I'll still we'll see things. I'll read those uh, at, at lunchtime, uh, sort of lunchtime in, in the morning break, and we'll, we'll see what's going on there. So, is there are there any questions before we dive in? Um, let's say, do you feel just a shout out? Do you put your hands up? I don't know. I struggle a bit with Teams, <laughs> uh, not with Teams, with with Zoom because it is quite different. Most annoying thing is if uh, if you do do the share screen thing, you have to click on the screen and then you have to press the share button, and I always forget to do that. So um, yes, let's do that. So hopefully you have managed to find uh, Posit Cloud and have clicked on that. And if I can work out where the share screen button is. I will share my screen, which is that one, I hope. Sorry, I haven't been able to. Is there a link we're supposed to click on or something? Yeah, uh, let me just pop it in the chat again. It is just. Ooh, let me see, it was the first one. Uh, what's it doing? There we go. Is that doing me? Uh, why is that not working? It won't let me send the message. Why is it not letting me send the message? Um, no. Uh, Group chat, that's what I need to do. Ah, there we go. Yes, if you sorry, um, I think I had my messages setting up to Bianca who's left. So hopefully you can see those are posit.cloud. And if I share. So posit uh rshudo.cloud or posit cloud will take you through to a login screen. I am already logged in. Let me unlog in, log out. And close that one. So it should take you onto, yeah, Posit Cloud. It should take you onto this page. If you already a user, then you can use that. Otherwise, you can do a get started. I'm already a user, and it will ask me who I want to log in as, and I've got. I've just got linked into my Google account. Just double check. I am sharing now, aren't I? Yes. Good. <laughs> uh, and then I can choose my account. And that will get me to a workspace. I've got a load of junk in my workspace because I've been doing various bits and pieces. Yours will probably be empty. Unless you obviously have done some stuff in the R Cloud before. Is everybody sort of at that stage or are we still going through? Yeah, everybody there? Yep. Cool. As I said, please shout if it's a no. I'm just going to have to assume yes, if not. And, uh, you know, this would be a very silly place to get left behind. So what we want to do is click on new project. And there's an object, uh, there's an option at the bottom that says new project from Git repository. And we want to use that. So over here, I've got a repository that I have built earlier where I have put all my code and some gubbins uh, around around that. And let me just copy that URL. Let me find where the chat is again. Where's the chat gone? Um, where's my Zoom? Oh my goodness me. Um, 
Yeah, what is going on here? Uh, chat, there we go. Let me pop that into the chat. You should be able to copy, copy that from the chat. And then when you're in the posit cloud, we should be able to paste that. Oh, no, it's not going to work like that, is it? Let me try that again. Sorry, I need to paste that as text into the chat. That's not going to let me, is it? Oh, my goodness me. Let's just try. Sorry about this. Right, let's try that again. I'll paste it into Word as text. There we go. Right. So if you copy that URL here, and then we should be able to then paste that into our bit there. And then you can click OK. So I'll just run that through again. We want new project, new project from Git repository, and then we want to paste that URL in there. And if we press OK, it should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get the same. Let's remove tree and main. Did that work? There we go. So delete where it says tree and main at the end. Oh, my goodness me. It does get better, honestly. Let's try doing that again. Where's my chat gone? Awesome. So, should eventually come up with uh, an R Studio page. Fantastic. So, it's every Body on way to there, or is anybody? Is it not start not going along that process? It's taking a while to load. Yeah, but it is going. Okay, that's fine. So it should eventually pop up with this, and you'll know it's worked because uh, you'll have some stuff over here, basically. Do you want to put your hands up if it has worked and then we can just double check if it's not worked on anybody? Oh, that's all good. I can't see all the hands, actually. If you can work out how to put your hands up. So is anybody stuck or is it not working at all? Or is it just taking a while? Uh, yeah, it's not really working for myself and Jamie, uh, the folks in NHS loading, but I think that's because of the network issues there are this morning. Oh. Um, so we, we've we've got a download that we, uh, of the of the GitHub okay. from a couple of days ago. So we've loaded yeah. that into our studio. We'll work from that, if that's okay. Uh, yes, I have made a few changes, like literally up to this morning. So oh, okay, it, right. There might be some bits, so it might be worth just going to the GitHub and um, basically, if you just go to the intertrain student version and then uh -huh. just copy, copy that and paste it into a script, it, that will work. For sure. Okay. And hopefully, there won't be any nice little NHS England nuances which will will throw things. So uh, basically, we want to open up this intertrain student version, and basically, so we just click on it, and it should uh, go up. Uh, ignore this bit about the the packages. We will come to that as we go there. So just click on "Don't Show Again" for now. 
And I'm just going to make my screen, my text a little bit bigger so that you can see it. Uh, appearance need. Okay. So you should hopefully have student version. And like I say the other version has got the, uh, well, it's got some example answers in it, although I haven't updated it with some of that. I made some tweaks to it yesterday. And even this morning, before about 10 minutes before the course, uh, just for a few tweaks here and there. So those haven't been updated with the, with the answers. But obviously, this GitHub's available. It's open to all. If you want to go back into it and, and have a look at it at any point, then that's uh, you know a really good thing to do. Uh, just a reminder of the help functions. So um, at any time, you can hover over a function and press F1. You can pr uh, you can type a uh, question mark and the function name in, in the console. Uh, you can search over here on the help bar. Um, and obviously, we've also got things like Google, uh, which are amazing for, uh, for, for searching as well. So definitely, we will be using the help functions to have a look sometimes about some of the extra features that our functions have got, uh, which will be really, really helpful. So just, just a reminder of those help functions. So uh, basically, I haven't set this up as slides. This is basically a workbook, uh, a script that we're going to work through together. So it's got some of my notes in there as well. But basically, what we're going to do is a bunch of data wrangling. Uh, we're assuming that you've already got a, 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 a knowledge of R and some sort of deep IS stuff. Assume you've already done like the, sort of the intro to course or you've got that. Uh, in this tutorial, we will be using uh, modern pipes rather than old fashioned pipes, um, but they are pretty much interchangeable. There are a few very strange edge cases where they're not interchangeable, um, but we're not gonna cover those. But for all intents and purposes, they, they are the same. So uh, we're gonna start off with um, using the tidyverse, our data sets, and uh, a package oh, called Pac-Man. Yeah, you just changed it in the settings. Oh, Sorry, what was that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so this nice little script here basically uh, is... Sorry, it... Simon. I think some people still aren't in. They're still... Is it still, is it still loading in? Yes. It's saying R is taking longer to start than usual and oh my just goodness. still loading. Ooh, okay. The alternative is, like I say, you could run a local version of R if you've got it on your desktop and uh, you can go to that um github and you can put the the data in there if, oh, so the script in there if you wish um so we cover that so yeah you could open up an r uh and then go to the the github which hopefully oh, i've already got the the link in there go to the intertrain student version and then you can literally do a control a and copy and then you can just paste that into uh, an R instance, if that's going to be easier, we just generally recommend using the cloud just so we all know, just for version control that and make sure that everybody's on exactly the same page. So, but anyway, for, while that is going, let me just go back to here. So, basically, what this script does is basically you can give it a list of all the packages that you wish to use. It will then check whether they're installed or not. If they're not installed, it will install them and then it will load them all in. So you can basically give it a list and you say, these are all the packages I'm gonna use. And then that means if I'm handing this over, this bit of code to somebody else, it will check whether they've got those packages installed. If it hasn't, it will install them for them and then it will load in those packages. So if we basically, uh, this is gonna be a fresh instance of our studio. So we're not gonna have Tidyverse installed. So if we run this, it will take some considerable time to load in the Tidyverse. Uh, Cause I don't know if you remember, but the Tidyverse is huge. So yeah, if we run that block of code there, that will load it in. I'll go through, we're going to be doing some sort of if statements and some conditional stuff, and hopefully we'll explain some of what this is doing here. But it's just a really nice piece of code to uh, 
you know, if you're handing over a, a piece of code to somebody else, as it were, um, that they can they can just run that and it will check. There are some more advanced ways of doing this, uh, which we're not going to go into now, where we can set up like our environments um, where specific libraries are sort of pre-installed, as it were, and I can hand over my environment to somebody else and they will be running it on exactly the same version as, as, as I am. Um, but we're not going to cover that, but something to be aware of, I think. So, oh my goodness me. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that is all loaded. Um, I'm just, hopefully those people who were on the desktop, they probably got Tidyverse installed already. Um, is anybody not there? Well, I'm assuming it's still chugging through if, if uh, you're a little bit behind. Has anybody not got the script yet? I said, I don't want to go on too far. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, that, like I said, that checks if the package is there, installs it, and we're all good. We're going to be using something called the NHSR data sets, where it's basically some people have donated some some nice uh, synonymized and anonymous data sets, and it just means that we're going to use some data sets, the dummy data, um, which is sort of NHSR, uh, sort of NHS based, rather than us trying to work out the quarterly sales for Northern Region, in you know, which is a lot of what a lot of courses do. So, first of all, what we're going to use is our NHSR data uh, frame, and we're it's got an object in there called uh, AE attendances, and we're just going to run that and create us some data. Um, so hopefully you should run that. And if the NHSR package is installed, we've got 12,765 observations of six variables. So it's quite a long piece of data, but not the most complicated. So let's have a quick look at it because that's what we always do to start off with. Um, as we can see, we've got a period. So we have got a time series, which will come in handy for some of the bits and pieces we do later. We've got an organization code for um uh, for, for this data. And then we've got type one, two, and other um attendances, breaches, and admissions. So for each timestamp, we have an organization code. We've got type one to another, and we've got the number of attendances, breaches, and admissions. So a relatively straightforward data set, and hopefully nothing there that is screaming at you that you have never seen such a thing such as that hopefully that's all relatively common to you so a few basic useful uh r functions which uh, I, I i find really useful uh great one is just call names which pretty much does what it says on the tin uh brings through the column names I find this is really, really useful because A, I am terrible at spelling and I always forget what my columns are called. So I use call names in my data and then I can click on here and then I can copy that and then I can paste it somewhere else in my analysis because I, you know, it's always, always getting uh, my, my column names wrong. And, and yeah, you'll see my dreadful spelling as we go on. Um, bit of base R. Um, I'm not sure if you've you've done this before, but you can do a data and then a dollar sign and then a column name. And that basically selects a single column um, and it turns it into a vector. So this is our data and it's our type. So if we go back to our data, it basically returns just this entire column of, of data, um, which will come in useful uh, if we want to do well, obviously we can see that's all it's uh, all in order but maybe i just want to see what are the unique data items in that in that variable so i can use a unique and that basically just tells me what are the unique values in that data so i can see that uh, the only results we've got in that type thing are one two and other i could change that to uh what have we got org i can't remember what it's called it's org code and that would give me a list of how many organization codes we have got in there, which is which is quite nice. Um, as I said, the dollar sign allows us to sort of call that column as a vector. What we can do on that, we can also slice it if we so wish. So if we look at that, that brings back our entire data frame. Oh, sorry, our entire 
column as a as a as a vector and say we wanted to return just the fourth instance we can do some square brackets and we can do data dollar sign type four and that should return uh, a one which indeed it does down here so if we look on our uh, data frame again and we look our fourth one down we can see it's returned that one so sometimes you want to return an individual uh, a thing. Uh, we can also do things like um, data type four to ten, which would give us those uh, the fourth to the tenth entries uh, like that. A big note to Python users: uh, R counts properly and starts counting at one and not zero. And the data type uh, four to ten will will include the tenth entry, so it works completely differently to Python. And uh, if you've ever done slicing between R and Python, it's a nightmare. So just to explain, Python starts counting at zero, so the first entry is entry zero, and it wouldn't include the final. It's just yeah, Python's wrong. We're not doing that Python anyway. So um, what we can also do is do things like get the n distinct, uh, which hopefully will uh, be straight, quite straightforward. It will give us the number of distinct entries. So if I wanted to know how many um, organizations I have got in my data set, I could do number of distinct org code, and we can see I've got 274 distinct organization codes. Again, this is really good when you've just sort of pulled in some data and you just want to check that you've got all your teams are in there or have you got the right amount of data points, you know, et cetera. So some really, really good things around there. Uh, you can get the range of variable. Again, really, really useful for dates. So if I do my range or my date period, it will give us my min and my max. Uh, I'd say really, really good to know that Okay, I've put my data in. Have I got the right period as it as it come through? Uh, another really useful um, command is the structure command or str, which tells us the structure of our data. So we know that my period has definitely come through as a date, and it's not stored as a as a string. My organization is a, is a factor. And my type is a factor. We'll be discussing factors later, um, which will be something to look forward to. Um, and then where I've got my attendances, breaches, and missions. And again, they've all come through as numbers. Um, as I'm sure you've probably encountered, especially if you're like importing stuff from, well, from anywhere really, Excel or SQL. Sometimes those numbers and you know things don't get imported correctly into the correct date format. Or or the right sort of format for the data you know quite often we will have things uh numbers stored as text or you know getting dates into a date format is a, a lovely joyous bit of wrangling which i'm sure we've all had to play with so um we can see things like we can use the head function which brings back the the head the header of the uh the, of the uh of the data so it just brings back the first uh well, it says five there, but it's actually the first six. Um, and then we can uh, bring back the sort of tail of the data so we can see what's at the end of the data. Uh, and that's quite useful. And if we want to see sort of slightly more, we can put a uh, a top, uh, sorry, a head 15. And it just brings back our the, the top 15 results from our, from our data. And then what we can do is we can also use a top N, which is a, a more a dplyr version of, of doing things where we can also see the sort of the top, um, top 15 results. Uh, what we can also do is uh, using a, a top fraction, we can look at the top 15% of our data. So regardless of how big our data frame is, it will bring back the top 15% of it, um, which can be quite a nice simple way of if you've ordered your data in a specific way by, I don't know, performance or whatever, and you just want to pull back who are the top 10 performers or 10% of performers, you can use this sort of top fraction of, uh, of stuff and it will bring back the, the sort of fraction of stuff. Um, likewise, a bit like I just said there, you can add in a an additional feature so that it's ordered by something else. So if I wanted to bring back who is our top 15% of uh, rows based on our attendances, we can do a top frac, data 15 which is our 15 percent and then based on the attendances 
And as you can see here, we've now got our top 15% of attendances. It doesn't order them in the actual return uh, for you, um, but it does give you the, the top sort of 15%. So, blimey, look at this. Already we've got an over to you. So this is where I hand over to you and you get to do X coding. So see if you can find uh, using uh, the top some sort of top or head or one of those things, can you find the lowest five attendances? Oh, and I'm assuming everybody is sort of now. Uh, So this is a really nasty one to start off with. So I'm very, so I must have been feeling pretty gnarly when I uh, um, wrote this. So we want to find the lowest number. So let's use top n because we want to find the no number. Uh, obviously, we want to use it on our data frame. Uh, that's a bit of a mystery at the moment. And then we want attendances. So we know we want that, but we want the five, but we want the lowest five. So how do we do that? Quite straightforward. We can put a minus five in there and it will basically give us the negation and give us the bottom five. So if we do that, we can see that these are our attendances uh, with our five lowest attendances going back to our data if we click on our attendances we can indeed what if it six two five one 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 six five two one one there we go so we've pulled out our six lowest attendances just by using the top n function does that make sense so the minus basically just flips stuff over and it's you know it's a quite a good thing to be able to do it gets we use it a few more times later on so uh, hopefully this is a try to remember that um uh, okay any questions on that one as i said i'm just gonna go fast and i'm gonna keep going unless anybody screams and uh, tells me not to Cool. Uh, so summary is another really, really awesome function. Um, Gaze gives, gives great summaries over different types of objects. Um, if you get into sort of regression and things like that, uh, summary you'll use summary all the time because it gives great uh, results of sort of regression models. But you can also just use it on uh, sort of bog standard, bog standard, or just you know ordinary data. And it will give you, uh, as best it can, a summary of the data. So it's told us here where well, we've got our, our period, our min and our max, and roughly what the, I guess the median would be our middle value and where our quantiles sit. Uh, where we've got types, it's given us a, a total of the number of types. So we know we've got uh, 4,000 or nearly 5,000 entries of type one, uh, just over a thousand entries of type two and about seven thousand of other, and also um, our attendances and our breaches and omissions again gives us our minimum and our max and our and our quantiles, just so that we can see that our data is in the sort of ballpark that we you know we we could be expecting. So just from this, we can see already that. You know, it isn't like a one to one relationship. So not every period has a type one, two and other. Obviously, it would appear that other seems to be the most popular or most frequent. Um, but obviously, it doesn't look like every every timestamp has got uh, a one to another. So something to bear in mind for, for later on. Um, what we can do is a lovely table function, which allows us to do quick counts by a by a column. So if I look at my table data table, um, again, this just gives me um, data dollar sign type, tells me how many type ones, how many type twos, and how many others, which basically is just this bit. So if I just want to pull that through onto onto one thing, that'd be really good. If I wanted to just do a table and I wanted to count how many um, 
organization codes we've got uh, we can just obviously look through that and we can see who's how many times each of these different organizations have have got uh, rows in the data so we can see not every organization has submitted for every single data point so some have got obviously lots uh, but some obviously have got considerably fewer so again really really nice way of just having a look at uh getting a quick count of have you got the right number of uh, uh data items again if you've just got a, like a time series it's a really good quick check to make sure that you have got the right number of of things coming through uh you can also do a table by two columns so you can feed in two columns to it and then it will give you uh basically a, a nice little table so now i've got a table of my type one twos and others and by each of my different uh, organizations, so I can see who submitted for what areas so, uh, and how many times they've submitted. So I can see that my ROA, L ROA has submitted 18 times for one to another, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a really, really quick and dirty way of just, you know, having a quick look at your data, which is, which is really useful. Cool. Um, like I said, those are all base R functions, uh, base R, doesn't get as much love as it should do. Everybody's, oh, we want to do the tidyverse, but actually Basar has got some really nice, funky little functions, which are really, really useful. Um, you can feed in three columns into a, a table function, um, but it does start getting a little bit silly around how it gets displayed. And uh, yeah, it's quite a challenge. So anyway, so let's do some wrangling so first thing to do is renaming our columns so quite often um you'll get a data set and it will have things like spaces in the column names all the column names in a different different sort of format and all this manner of horrible horrible horribleness which we don't like I we use NHSR data frames, um, uh, sorry, data sets, which comes pre-packaged with a, a nice, uh, a nice um, uh, set of column names. So we're going to have to mess it up in order for our, 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 our test here. So what we want to do is we want to create here a new. Uh, we want to re all. We want to rename our organization code, and we're going to rename it to organization space code. So this is your absolutely classic when we pull in some data from Excel. Excel doesn't care about spaces and all these kind of stuff, doesn't care about cases and all that malarkey. So if we do this data, a data rename organization code equals all code. When we look at our data now, let me just close that and go back there. It should open up one day. Uh, you can see now we've got a organization space code as our as our um, name of our column. If we're going to use that, we've got to use these lovely things called backticks to put our, our data in. Backtick is on the top left hand side of your keyboard next to your number one uh, up there uh, above your tab key. And it's a real pain in the neck to have to use those every time you want to use a column name. So. I we we come to how we can convert everything really really nicely easy in a minute. Um, we can also uh, yeah, so let's also name some more of our uh, variables into something horrible. So let's do this. We can we're going to give it a capital B. We're going to have one that's going to be uh, uh, all in capitals and even even most evil we're going to do a a trade not a trading sorry a, a space in front of our uh, um uh column name which believe me i have seen in in um sql tables um uh, before that yeah comes up with a space at the at the start um so if we look at our data now We've got period where it's your shouty. We've got our organization code where we've got a space. We've got breaches and it's all just horrid. Um, or as we call it, a normal NHS data table. So we are going to uh, use a lovely package called Janitor, uh, which does what it says on the It comes in and it does some cleaning. So we will not have this installed. So let's install this. 
um, and we can do library install Janta. Hopefully, you know how to do that. Of course, what we could do as well is take our janitor and we could add it into our list here. And then if we run all of this malarkey, it would then check if it's installed. If it's not installed, it will install it and then it will uh, load it in. Uh, let's go back again. Where are we? So let me do that and do library janitor. So um, it has got a, a few conflicts with the package stats, but we're not going to do any child square tests or fish tests today. So we're all good. So janitor has got one of my favorite functions in the whole world called clean names, which uh, whenever I do any sort of project, I think and load tidyverse second after that is is janitor so if i do my data clean names data and we run that doesn't seem to done anything particularly exciting until we then go and look at my data and what has it done what has it done what has it done it has uh put everything into snake case so everything's going to be lowercase um any um initial front loaded um numbers or spaces are removed uh any spaces are replaced with underscores everything now is in a nice snake case uh format which is which is lovely uh i much prefer working in that i find the benefit of having snake case is that uh if i've got my call names uh data where are we here? Now I can double click on my organization code and I can paste that into my whatever it is I'm doing my analysis. If I've got it in this hideous format. Oh, oh I need to go back here. Let me, uh, blah, 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 blah. where are we? Where's my data up here? Sorry, go back to its original. If I've got my data with a space in it and it's in this this kind of format, and then I do my call names, when I double click on it, it doesn't work. It just picks up the organization or it picks up the code. And then I have end up having to do that. And then I've got to paste it in somewhere. And I've got to remember to put back ticks in and all of that. And it becomes or what I generally do is then I'll paste it and then I'll try to put back ticks around it and then I'll have to do that and I'll make sure oh, it's just messy and horrible. So don't do that. So uh, over to you. Have a quick name, uh, quick try at renaming breaches to number of breaches with spaces in it and then put it back again to breaches. This... It is a little bit frustrating in that, like I said, the hint is check the order of your rename. So for all those people who are really, really used to SQL, it works backwards as in you do your alias equals your thing, not your thing as alias. So have a quick try at renaming your breaches. So we can do data is data rename number of breaches is breaches. And then if we want to convert it back again, so double check that it has come through.
Ah, this is where it all gets interesting. So you might have got stumped when it came to changing it back again, because instead of the back ticks, you have to use normal. Well, you could use back ticks, I guess. It wouldn't probably matter, but good practice would be to use normal quotations for your breaches. So it's go equals to your back ticks number of breaches. Ugh. All of that, hopefully, will give you especially that second bit around converting it back again, we'll just explain why we do not want to use horrible spaces in our column names. So it just comes really, really hard to work with. Okay, uh, just to say, Dan at Janitor has got some other amazing functions. Uh, if you get Excel dates, you know when Excel does that weird thing where it converts a date into a number? Uh, it, it's got a function that converts that number back into a date. It's got some fabulous duplication, um, uh, row duplication uh, things around how to remove duplicate rows from your data based on various different things. So it will replace, you know, uh, just any duplicate, it will just remove the duplicate. Or if you want to remove a basic duplicate on these things, but based on a rule on different columns, you can do some really, really nice things around that, uh, which is really cool. It also has, uh, a really nice way of just adding totals to things really, really quickly. And it's also got a, it's got its own table function uh, spelt with a Y, um, which takes over from the base R um, table function, which I just showed you and does some more funky sort of things. But anyway, uh, I'm not going to go into those, but do check out the, the, the janitor package. It's really, really good. So where are we at for time? We're doing well. Uh, any questions on renaming? Anybody get stuck? Please do shout. We're all good. I say, please shout at me if not. So, super useful select statement and something that I can never ever spell. Um, so, if you see me write the word select, I will spell it wrong. Uh, the first E just disappears from my fingers no matter what I'm coding, and especially it causes a few problems in SQL. So select statement pretty much works like a SQL statement. I'm assuming most people here do SQL, but obviously if you don't, then that means nothing. But basically it allows us to select columns from a data frame. And what's also super useful is that they will be ordered in the way that we select them. So uh, let me just double check. We should probably do this. Uh, where are we? If we do this first, if you just do your data and just do AE attendances again, just so that we've reset our data and it's all, all super clean and we haven't called it lots of stupid things because um, that would mess things up. Uh, so if we do data attendances, so if we do data select and we do our data and select period and org code, we'll create a new um, object here. And as you can very much imagine, we have just got two columns in our new data set. God, this is slow today. Um, all right. Anyway, believe me, uh, yeah, it's been really slow. What is going on? Anyway, we can see that we have got two uh, two columns in it, one called period, one called all code, and it's in that order, as in the order that I've selected it, which is really, really good. Um, Likewise, if we did the opposite, as it were, if we did all code then period, when we viewed our data, it would come in, in into uh, that that area. So just to say, uh, yep. So I've included a view statement here, so which is your obviously classic way of of looking at a data set uh, is using the view. Although for some reason it does not want to play ball. What is going on there? There we go, finally. Um, so that is one way, obviously, to view the data set. The probably classic version is to go up in the global environment and click here, which, as everybody knows, sort of just creates a, a view data set down here in the console. 
Uh, another really nice way that I like to use is if you hold down the control key and click on an object, as in data select, that will also uh, cause a view statement to come up. And you can click on it anywhere it appears. So let's say if you've got a data frame object there, you can just do control, hold down control and click on it. And that should trigger a, um, uh, a view. So mine's been really slow. So I don't know why that is. Yeah, there we go. Um, and that's really, really nice. And you you can use that if that data select is in the middle of something else. You can, you know, you can click on it in the middle of something here and it would it would come through if it if it is an object, uh, which is really, really nice. Anyway, uh, we can also do um, a nice thing in uh, our uh, our select statement and that we can do a rename. So, again, very much like a SQL where you can apply an alias to something. We can do that within a select statement. So we can do our select again. We want to do it backwards to to um, to SQL. So we put our alias first and then our our uh, item. So if we do that, and we can do data select, and we want to change our period. To, we're going to call it date period, and our org code. We're going to change to org organization, and then if we click up here. Oh you can see now that we've got new column names. So again, really, really nice way of doing uh, a rename and a select in one go, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, we can also do a, a, a exclamation mark for a negative or a minus. Um, so if we've got our data and we want to not select org code and period, um, and we run that one, I'm just going to look at it here. We can see now that's removed org name and period from our data set. So sometimes it's easier to say what you want to remove rather than what you want to include. Um, yeah, whatever's going to be easier. Um, and so let's say if you want to do multiples in that way, then you do have to put them into this kind of vector. If you do individual uh, ones with a, a not, so if I did select data, not all code, not period, uh, as you can see, that doesn't work. Um, it's removed, it doesn't actually remove, oh yeah, it's removed org code. That was the first, oh no, it hasn't. Uh, yeah, hasn't removed any of those. So that, that doesn't work. However, if you do a minus and do multiple things, that does work. So that has removed org code and period. So, Different ways of doing things. I'm not a hundred percent sure, and uh, why that doesn't work and that one does. Um, and I'm sure somebody very clever one day will tell me. Um, but anyway, uh, that's that's for another day. But anyway, that's a really nice way if you just want to remove a couple of things. We can also use some additional verbs in our select statement, which becomes really really powerful when we're doing some other bits. And let's say this select verbs come in, comes in really, really handy at later point. So say we wanted to um, select only columns which contain ES, which if we look at here, our, our data set, that would be our, uh, our attendances, breaches, and admissions. So that should just select those three. And if we go here, uh, I oh, know, not admissions. Admissions hasn't got an ES in it. What am I talking about? Uh, admissions and breaches. Uh, sorry, spelling's not my strong point. Uh, so, yeah. So if we've got something and we want to uh, do that, again, really, really good if you've tagged your code with uh, and made column names, which are really, really useful. And, you know, if you've done a whole load of summaries and you've made totals and you've given them all a prefix of tot or tot or total or something, and you just want to select those columns, uh, again, really, really useful way of doing that. Uh, we can do a not contain. So we can do a, an exclamation mark in there and we can do our select. And they basically that will remove anything that does contain the ES. So if we do our not contains ES, removes those. We can also look at the data types. So we can look at some of the metadata within our data types and say, 
maybe we want to look at our data and we only want to select data where it's numeric data. So sometimes you'll come up with a load of stuff and you just want to get to the numeric data. So we can do a select where is numeric. And if we look at that here, obviously that's just then turn, returned our attendances, breaches and admissions. Um, and we can also use this fabulous everything uh, function as well. So say we want a certain couple of things and then everything else. So we just want to make sure that our admissions and breaches are first. And then we just want everything else after that. And then if we look at our, our data here, we've got admissions, breaches, and then everything else. And it's not duplicated. So it takes into account what's already, what you've already selected and it's just brought back everything else. So that's pretty cool. So over to you. Uh, so can you select the data so that it is in the order? So we've got admissions first, then any column that is a factor, and then anything else. So again, but and by using select, so we're looking at our data types and also what it contains. So we want our admissions first, then we want any column that is a factor, and then anything or everything else, as it were. So again, just to show that you can do multiple things uh, for a select and reordering your columns is quite a good thing to do, especially when it comes to sort of putting them into a table or, or something like that. Quite often, obviously, you want your columns in a in a, in a certain order. So, so we haven't covered uh, factors as yet, but yeah, we, we'll come to that in a minute later on. So, so what? admissions first so that should be quite straightforward then we want any column that is a factor so if we look at our where is numeric we know we've got this data type called numeric we also know there's a data type called factor so let's copy that in and change where it says numeric to factor and then we want anything or everything else. Uh, run that through. We should then see we've got our missions. We've got our two columns here, which are factor was previously in. Did everybody get that? Any questions on that one? So please shout if I'm going too fast. Nope. No kidoki. Or if you do get massively shout, also put stuff into the chat. I can't see the chat, but Anya is here to shout if you do. Um, so Anya, if anybody's going, oh, I'm stuck, please, please be their advocate and shout at me. Cool. Uh, so where are we doing for time? We're doing great. So uh, let's do some alternative joins. So we've probably done like left joins and right joins and inner and outer joins. If you haven't done those, do thoroughly recommend you go back to the NHS introduction to our training stuff. There's an amazing bit around, you know, your general left joins. But then if you also want to go into sort of like anti joins and all of those kind of things, really really useful uh tutorials there not going to go into those now i'm just going to go into some sort of concatenation uh so concatenation isn't about doing that sort of join on a key it's literally about shoving two data sets together uh without keys so let's just have a look at two uh data sets here we're going to create a data set data frame here which is just going to be our uh, our columns here uh, of our period or code type and attendances and our second data frame is just going to be our numeric um, 
uh, columns. So if we look at our data frame one and data frame two. So data frame one is just got this in it and data frame two has just got this in it. And what we wanna do is bind them together side by side. So I wanna get data frame two and basically add it to data frame one. So this is data frame one and I wanna put data frame two here next to it on its side to make one joined up data set. Um, and it's not going to be linked by any specific uh, key or anything. It's literally, I'm going to get this data set and I'm going to paste it here in that order that it's currently in. So it's literally binding them together. So uh, we can do something called column bind uh, or C bind. So we're going to get our new data frame and we're going to C bind uh, data frame one and data frame two to make our new data frame. And then if we look at our new data frame, we now have a, a, a new data frame and it's literally shoved them together. Uh, R uh, has done something uh, a bit cleverer for us. It's realized that we did have a duplicate column name. Um, so it's basically just changed one of those to a attendances dot one so that we know we have got that duplicate but as i can as you can see it's literally just pasted that onto the side of that other data set so it's not done it by any key or anything it's literally shoved them side by side um so let's just try a, another one uh so we're going to do we're going to do row binding this time so we're going to do a similar sort of thing so if we look at our data uh Sorry, let's create two new data frames, data frame one and data frame two. And look at those. So this time we have got uh, a mini data frame there and we've got same sort of data frame there. And what I want to do is take this data frame and paste it on the bottom here. And I want to paste it here. Obviously this time we do have matching uh, column names. so. I'm going to paste the data and I want to paste basically just paste new rows into our data. So we are going to use the bind rows function. And if we do that and we look at our DF new, now we can see we have one data frame where I basically pasted one on top of the other. All our column names are the same, so we're all happily happy. So let's have a look at what happens if we don't have the same. Uh, column names when we try to do this. So let's make up two new data frames. And look at our data frame one, where we have got, what have we got? We've got period, all code type and admissions. And our data frame two has got, it's got some of the same things, but it's also got some additional things. So we still wanna paste this data frame onto the bottom here of this data frame. So let's see how R copes with that. Oh, how does it work? Oop, DF new. So if we look at our DF new, oh, not DF two, DF new. Oh yeah. As you can see, it has pasted it on the bottom where there were gaps in our original data frame, it's now filled those in with NAs or, or sort of basic nulls in there, and it's pasted those on the bottom there. Okay, does that make sense? So that's literally sort of pasting one set of data onto the on the bottom of the other. So what have we got here? Create a data frame with the top five admissions only and the bottom five attendances only and then join the columns together. So, okay, that's interesting. So going back to some of the stuff we did earlier around tops and uh, and, and numbers and uh, things like that, top, top ends, I think it was. Uh, see if you can find the top attendances, the top, uh, what was it, admissions, and then join them together. 
and just just that single column together. So we have one column which will be gibberish because it won't make sense because it's uh, it, it will make yeah make no sense. And then we are going to join it together. I know. When, yeah, we're going to side by side, isn't it? Because it's columns, not rows. I always get that muddled up. Yeah. So they'll be side by side. So we'll have one data frame, which will have two columns in it. One will be the top five admissions. One, no. Yeah. Top five admissions. And the other will be the bottom five attendances. So pretty much as we did. Let's make two day of frames. So again, this is about using our stuff, what we've learned. So we're going to use our select, which is quite a nice, easy one, just selecting our admissions. And then we're going to pipe in our top five, and we want to base that on our admissions. So we're going to do our uh, data is our select, our admissions, our top five admissions. And then our data two is going to be, uh, what was it, breach attendances. Select attendances, then we want the top and and we want the minus five because we want the bottom. We want attendances, I can't spell. And then we want our DF new five. Oh, calls. Yeah. I do you oh, she fine. So you should hopefully come up with something that looks like that. Again, use case for doing something quite as weird as that might I don't know. But I suppose sometimes you do want those sort of top five results and they're based on different criteria and sometimes low is good. So having that mix and match uh, type approach would be uh, one way of doing it. Um, obviously, that's doing it by two different uh, data frames. You probably could do that all in one sort of pipe. Um, but yeah, we're not going to go there for now. Let's do this. Where are we? We are at 10 to 11. All right, we're going to finish off doing some combining, I think. Yeah, and then we're going to do some, uh, some more grouping. By. So uh, if you want to join columns of different sizes, um, as it says, it's, it's probably best to use the joins and sort of left joins and right joins and the various different types of joins. Um, so combining rows that exist in both tables and dropping duplicates. So going to rename breaches to admissions and create some duplicates. That will make some sense when we do it. So if we do a DF1 and a DF2, uh, and we're just going to rename our breaches to admissions and, and pull those through. So if we look at our DF1, oops. My goodness me, we've now got this big data set of all these different things and we've called them admissions. Uh, we've also got a DF2, which is another uh, data frame, which is also called admissions. And now what we want to do is union them together. Um, and basically it will combine the rows that exist in both tables and it will drop any duplicates. So if there are any matching values, 
it will drop any duplicate values. So if we look at our DF1, which is 12,765, and we times that by two, oops, interesting. Uh, 12, seven, six, five times, uh, seven, six, five times two is that. And if we run that one, we can see that it's dropped. It hasn't just added one on top of the other. Uh, we can see we've only, it's only returned 13,597. So anytime there's been a duplicate, it's dropped them. Probably the duplicates are all the all the zeros uh, in in both of those data sets. So, yeah. Uh, what's also a really really good thing we can do is we can find identical columns in uh, uh, or where we've got the same. So if we look at our DF intersect, this tells us where we've got matching values. So if we look at our two data sets this is telling us where we've got matches so literally as we as i properly predicted we've got lots of matches where we've got zeros and we've got some other things in here so again that's a really nice way if you've got two data frames and or two columns and you want to know do the values match where do they match and which ones match which is great and also we can do the difference so we can set, set the difference so we can look at a column of values and another column of values and see where we've got distinct values in both of those columns. So basically, if we, we're expecting the columns to be the same and they're not, this will tell us what our differences are. I'm not sure I've explained that terribly well, but hopefully that has um, really great use for that cases. I mean, I, I deal with a lot of trusts and, and icbs so if i've got my list of trusts and they're in one data set and i've got my list of trusts in another data set and i want to compare have have i got the right things for both i can uh view diff and it will tell me if there's any any that are in one and not the other the other great one is if, if i've got if i've got two time series and i want to make sure that i've got if i've got you know a, a, a value in one but not in the other which is the which date is it that's missing in one of them um so again this this um set diff is is really powerful for doing that kind of stuff okie dokie uh it is 10 to 11 we're about to do some grouping and mutating and summarizing but um first of all are there any questions on that otherwise i recommend we take a quick sort of five ten minute break go grab some more coffee and uh rock gently to ourselves so, are there any questions i say or literally comments us and simon slow down a bit i'm struggling <laughs> simon hurry up you're going too slow simon you're just doing just right that's perfect or or where are we going how do i get onto our studio why am i here okay well, complete silence. I'll take that as uh, hopefully some people are still here. Um, I was just talking to myself all day again. Uh, so if everybody could pop back by 11, let's take a quick eight minute break and uh, grab some coffee. See you in a minute.
Okay, hopefully most people are slowly coming back into the room. Um, thank you, Anya, for picking up the chat as we go along. Um, do check it in there. I say Anya's hopefully here to sort of answer any any immediate questions. Um, I'll just whiz through the chat. Nobody's got anything specifically around lunchtime break so we just keep going until i burst and uh yeah need to have lunch other than that uh very interesting range of pokemon all good to know um yeah yeah a couple of the classics there without a doubt uh nice to see snorlax big shout out to magikarp Nidoram's a bit of a left fielder one there, Susie. That's uh, not one of the classics, but interesting. Uh, nobody's come out with the, like, the weird ice cream cone one or anything like that, which is good. Uh, shout out to Evie and obviously uh, boring old Pikachu. But there we go. Cool. Uh, right, we're now at 11 o'clock. Let's carry on. Uh, ew, I don't know. I do the whole shout out on Silly Dad Joke about hands up who's not here. No. Okay. Um like I say, do give me a shout if pace gets too too messy or, or whatever. So let's do some group within mutates and summarizes. So uh, this may or may not be you, new to you, depending on when you did your like intermediate R training or sorry, intro to R training or how long you've been using R. Um, so we'll just quickly cover it. So say we want to get our data and we want to group it by the type and we're just going to do a count of our, uh, our, our types and uh, create a quick summary table. Old school way would be doing it is we would have our group bar, then we summarize. And obviously, because we're good people, we would ungroup our, our grouping. Let me just close down some of these. And if we look at our data, old method. That would give us our type, our, our counts per, per type, as it were. New school is what we can do is this dot by function within our summary. So oh, that should be data new, shouldn't it? Look at that. Uh, data new is our data and we're summarizing it. And when we can add this extra thing called a dot by type. And what that does is basically adds in the group by and also ungroups it by default. So if we run this one and we look at our data new, it's exactly the same, which is great. And this has obviously got less code. And we also don't run into the joys of the grouped data frame, which I doesn't doesn't cause any issues 99% of the time until the point that it does at which point you will be scratching your head trying to work out why isn't this working uh Susie I'm just going to pick on your example that we had the other day where you created a grouped data frame and then trying adding row numbers to it and it automatically added row numbers by each of the groups even though we didn't realize it was a group data frame so when we try to add row numbers to it it yeah, it all went hideously wrong. So uh, mm. ungrouping stuff is, is 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 really, really good practice. And by having it within this uh, method here is, is the way to do it. So again, just, just use another old school example. Uh, so we're just going to mutate and we're just going to double our admissions and times it, which would be, be our admissions times two. So we look at our oh, data. Let's get rid of some of this rubbish. Uh, if we look at our data old, uh, we've now got our double layer of missions, which is here. We've grouped it by each of our, our, our um, types. And then if we do it new, I'm going to change that to new again, uh, does exactly the same. And we've done a mutate. Uh, so I think so. Just to, just to clarify again, when we're doing a group by um, Within a summarize, we are summarizing our data and we're kind of creating a pivot table. Within a mutate, we're creating a new column within our data frame. So when we look at our data new, what we are doing, we're grouping it by, what are we grouping it by? I can't remember, our type. Um, uh, where are we here? 
So it would be our type. So our admissions is twice of our type one admissions. And there we go. So yeah, uh, or, or type of, so admissions by each of those types times by two. Cool, okay, um, which, does lead us on to doing some some nice things. As I said, the the nice thing about that is you don't have to do a drop. Uh, even a better way of doing this sort of count method here is using the count function. So again, this is sort of like a tidy version of the, the table function. Uh, so if we do our data count, it's our data and we want to count our type Basically, then, if we look at our data count, what that provides us is that summary table. So basically, data count type there is exactly the same as that. Uh, so it takes our data, it's summarizing it by count, it's doing a count, and it's doing a by type. So it's just a really, really quick way of, you know, <laughs> that that was quicker than the old school way of doing it. This is then quicker than doing it now. So if you just want counts by by groups, uh, count is a really, really nice way to do that. Um, we can also create a new column, um, which is a bit like doing a mutate. Um, so we want to see how many times an organization code has been submitted. So instead of just doing a count, we can we can do a, a, a count of our organization code. So let's have a look at what that looks like. That might make more sense. And we look at our data count. We can now see that we've got this new column. So it's done a, a instead of a summarize, it's done a sort of mutate method. So we've added a count and we've added a count for this organization code. So we know this organization code. RF4 appears 180, time, 180 times in this data set. So if I reverse the order of this, it'll probably make more sense because we can see it then. We can see this organization code has only got one row of data. This organization's got one row of data. This organization code, as we can see, has got one, two, three. Uh, this organization code's got four, et cetera, et cetera, as we go down. Uh, just check this one, it's got seven. Oh, they're not in order, so that doesn't make it really easy. Uh, if I do that one as well, so that they are in order. Anyway, hope you get the point. So the add count basically adds a column count. So that's the equivalent of doing a mutate rather than a summarize. Um, so the equivalent for that would be, uh, let me just do that. That would be a mutate. Uh, yeah. So that would be the equivalent of that. I'll just pop that into the chat if you want to copy that into your bit of code. There we go. So, um, so count really nice little uh, feature uh, just for sort of doing well counts really. Uh, so let's do some uh, fancy filtering. Uh, fancy filtering uh, allows us to do some filtering. What is fancy? So we're going to use some string R functions and some various other, other bits and pieces. So maybe we want to filter our data to organize uh, to our org codes, which contain an R at any point. So I'm sure you've done lots of filters on, on various different things. Using this string detect, we can basically look in our organization codes and bring back anything that's got a letter R in it. Um, so if we do a uh, data filter and we look at our data filter here, we can see that our org codes now all have the letter R in it, which is nice. And it's at any point as well. So it's not just starting with the letter R, it, you know, any any point that it contains the letter R, it will bring it through. Um, what we can also do is a group by within filter, which is a bit mind blowing. Um, so let's have a look. So we want to filter our data so that it brings back the latest date per organization code. So basically we can see, say this was a, a submission or whatever, 
what was the latest date each organization code has submitted data in this data set. So I'm going to take our data set. We're going to create a, uh, we want to filter it so that the period is the maximum of the period, but we're going to group it by the organization code. So we'll group it by the organization code and bring back a max per um, uh, blah, 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 uh, organization code. <laughs> Oh, good grief. Words, Simon, that's what we need. Uh, let me just, yeah, so that's right. So there we go. So we can see for each of these organizations, we can uh, check that. So let's just do some quick check functions that it's worked. So if we do table uh, data uh, org code, we should, no, because it's not data it's data data filter that's what i'm yeah Oof, give us that uh data filter we should see that we've got ones oh no we've got freeze okay that's interesting oh because they might have um submitted a one a two and a other in our data set so that's fine Phew, that's all right but most of it we can see ones so we can see we have definitely got the right amount of data in there and i guess if i auger do it by org code, we might be able to spot one where they've we scrolled out. There we go. We have got, indeed, got some entries where they've submitted a one, two, and other. But now we can see the latest date for each of these organizations. What was the last date they submitted data for thing? So again, having a group by within a filter is probably not something you would think of normally. It's definitely something I didn't used to do, but it's a it's a really funky, cool thing that you can do. So uh, we can also obviously add multiple features to our filter. So we can filter on our type ones, and we can also do sort of conditionals within our filter, which I'm sure you're aware of. So we can look at our data filter, where we've got type ones and our attendances are over 10,000. And we look at that, we've got type ones and yes, all our attendances are over 10,000. So that's great. Uh, what we can also do is this lovely straight line here, which is bottom left hand side of your keyboard next to your shift button between the shift and the Z button. If you do shift and back arrow, you'll get this straight line and that denotes an or. You can write the word or as well if you wish, but all the cool kids use proper notation. Um, and that will then give us an or. So that will filter our data where the type is one or the attendances are over 10,000. So we can do like uh, an either or. Uh, so if we now look at our data filter, we can see that we've got our type ones are in there and that's going to be all of them because that was our thing. Or it's run back some of these others where we've got attendances over 10,000. So you can add in ors. I would be really, really mindful of using ors. Ors are a really, really, really sticky thing and can go, go south really, really quickly. Uh, and especially if you use them in, in SQL, you've got to be really mindful of how you use your brackets and what bits it's evaluating at what stage. And if you find that you're using, I would definitely recommend if you find that you're using more than one or statement than, or, or, or feature, then maybe you want to do it a different way because it's probably, yeah, not, not a good thing. So over to you. Can you write a script to see if we have uh, one row per organization. And if we don't, return only those where we have more than one row. For bonus points, can you put them in order by the number of rows? So we're not going to be using uh, row numbering features here. We're going to use what we use here. So we're going to be using our counts. Um, so think think of that. We're, we're not going to be using the, the, the ranking functions and all of that kind of malarkey. Uh, we use the count, so we want a count of, of, of rows, and then, uh, yeah, we return those where we have more than one row, so we want to do uh, some sort of way of filtering the data, and then uh, see if we can remember how to put things in order. Um, 
so we can oh, look at my hint. I was feeling very clever that day. Uh, you can count on the fact we've already covered how to do this and also maybe have a look at what else the function can do. Look at that. I was far too kind. Far too kind. Give you two seconds. So we're going to take our data and then we want to count our all codes. Uh, we've got this bit where we wanted to put them in order of rows and is maybe look at what else the function can do. So I'm going to hover over my count function oh, and not press. I'm going to press my F1. Blah, 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 blah. I'll count the observations in the group. Takes the X, which is our thing. Oh, look at this. We've got some additional little features our count function can do. One of them is sort. By default, it's set as false, but I want it to sort it. So I can do my sort equals true. Look at that. And then, so if I look at that and I look at my data, oh, it's given me my data there and my ends. And what do I want to do? I want to. Only where we've got more than one row. So I've got scrolly down. Or well, I could just press the top, it would have been much quicker. I have got a, bunch, a couple here at the bottom where I've got one. So I want to remove those. So I'll do filter uh, n greater than one. And then if I run that one, look at it. There we go. I've chopped me ones off. Everybody get that? Any issues there? And again, when we were looking at that thing earlier, where we were um, looking at our top five, top five admissions and our top five dish or our bottom five discharges, we could do that sort within that, um, and that would be also also quite quite cool. Cool. Uh, right. So where are we? We are on conditionals. So basic two part conditional is our if else. Um, I'm not sure, probably uh, quite classic within Excel, within SQL, various different languages. So we're basically going to say, if it's this, then do this. And if it's not this, then do that. Uh, and we have a basic, nice, simple if underscore else dplyr version of the if else statement. Uh, and it works quite simply. We, we we take our data. We're going to create a new column. So we're going to do a mutate and we're going to call it above 20,000. So basically, we want to add a new flag into our data set, which will be a yes, a y for uh, where we've got attendances over 25, uh, over 20,000 and an N for not. So if we run that and we look at our data, we've now got this little flag where our attendances are over 20,000. We've got a Y and where it's not, we've got an N. So quite simple and straightforward, I hope. If we order it by attendances, we should, if we do it that way around, we should 
be able to see around 20,000. All our Ys, we should see this cut off. And then, yeah, we can clearly see that below 20,000, our little flag then turns to a no. So really, really good, cool, useful stuff. Um, really, really important is, and um, it's a bit of a, a, our thing, we can't mix up data types uh, within uh, a column. Doesn't let us do that. Um, so if we came up with something like this, and we've got our two conditions, and I wanted to say, I don't know, above 10,000, 20,000, and I want to change that to 100, which is a no, obviously. And then underneath that, if it's not true, I want it to say the words um, at 100. So let's just change that. Yeah, that sort of makes sense. So if I try to run that, so if it's above 20,000, I want the number 100. And if it's below 20,000, I want the word 100. Uh, and if I run that, it will throw a wobble. And also give me a really nice error message. Uh, well, not really nice. No error message is nice. But it does actually tell me what the problem is. So it can't combine the true, which is this first bit, which is a double, and the false, which is a character. So it's literally telling me I can't mix my numerics and my characters together and also tells me which one is which. Is which. So if I wanted to change it, uh, I could do that. So that would be really cool. So I can have one, you know, as long as they're consistent. So if I want to change that to, I don't know, 99999, for instance, then if I run that one, uh, it should be a happy bunny. There we go. And then if I looked at my data, I'll have, ooh, if I close my data and then relook at it, I should have this weird flag now that says, yeah, 999 or 100, etc. So all good. So uh, that's really, really good for a single condition where you've got like, if this, then that, or if not, do that. What you can do is nest if if statements. So you can say, if it's this, do this. If it's not, then if else this, then do this. Else, if and you can do this horrible, horrible, horrible nested if else statements, which if you've done multiple, uh, that's very much the Excel way of doing things, um, unfortunately, because there isn't a sort of the equivalent of a case statement. If you've used uh, SQL, then case statements, you know what a case statement is. But yeah, that's that's if you're if you're old school and coming from SQL up uh, Excel, that would be the way of doing it. Thankfully, we we uh we're we're cool kids using R and we've got a case statement. So if you've not used case statements before, basically it's a multiple condition where you can set up multiple conditions and uh, it will evaluate it. And the first condition that it meets is what it will uh, go through. So we're going to take, we're going to create ourselves a little uh, grouping of attendances. So we're going to say our attendance grouping, and then we're going to do a case when attendances are less than 5,000. We're going to say less than 5,000, where it's less than 10,000. We're going to do it. So as you can see, we've created this sort of uh, grouping of, of uh, different uh, attendances. And then at the end of it, we need to give it a else. So it's very still much like an if else statement. And so we're going to say, if it doesn't meet any of these criteria, then our default, we will assume that it is this, okay? So that's the new school way of doing it, a bit like the, the dot uh, by within a, a, a group by, uh, sorry, the mutator, et cetera. The dot default is the modern way of using a, um, uh, uh, a case statement. This uh, again, we're using funky little symbols on our on our keyboard, which don't get as much love as they do in normally. This is called a tilde. You will find it above your hash key. So if you do shift and hash, uh, you'll get a tilde sign. Um, case statements is one of the main places you use them. They're used in uh, they use quite a lot in modeling stuff. If, so if you've done like linear models and things, they're they're sort of used there. Um, not going to go into a great deal of what and things, but in essence, within a case statement, it's the equivalent of the word then. So case when attendances are less than 5,000, then this is your answer, etc. So if we run this little uh, 
this little bit of script and we look at our data we've now got this attendance grouping where it's basically looked at our attendances and it's plopped them all in uh, an appropriate group which is quite nice uh, what you might find is, as I said, that's the new school way of doing it, the old school way of doing it. So you might come across this. So I'm just going to have it here so that you can see it, is that you would have your else uh, as a true statement and you would give that a tilde and uh, have your sort of default. So the dot default you have is a dot default and that's equals. Um, and But the old school way of doing it would be a true and with a tilde. Don't know why that bit has swapped over and changed. It just has. So anyway, so like I say, the, the true, uh, it's not called a tilde R, it's called a tilde. Um, anyway, um, and like I say, it's uh, used rather than equals. So, but they both work exactly the same. So if you see any of my older code, then I've probably got that in there. So, Let's make a deliberate issue. So going back to, uh, and I'm sure you've all spotted it because you're fabulous analysts, just say we had an attendance which was exactly 25,000. Um, technically, according to this, uh, we're a bit wrong because uh, if it is exactly 25,000, well, I guess, it should, I suppose this should say 25,000 and over, which in which case it would probably be true. Um, but for the sake of argument, and I probably need to adjust that actually, let's just manually put in a, a, an issue. And we're going to say our data attendances is going to be 25,000. So I'm going to look again with my slicing. I'm going to slice my data attendance column. I'm going to look at position one, and I'm going to assign that the value 25,000. Uh, exactly. So if I do that and I look at my data, oh, no, not that one. Let's close that and go back into it. Now, when I look at my data, you can see that's now updated and I've got 25,000 in there. Um, obviously, it's not good practice to manually uh, augment your data ever as an analyst. Never, never mess with your data in that kind of way. But for the sake of this, we're, we're going to be manually changing that. Uh, so if I run this one now, uh, this, this case statement again, and we put it in there and we look at our data, technically where I've got my 25,000, it's now saying it's over 25,000, which technically isn't true. Um, I think I do need to change this example because that doesn't make sense. But anyway, just pretend I, I'm saying that it's over 25,000 where it isn't. Um, the other issue is, is let's put in some null data. So I'm going to put a null now into my data set. And this will probably show it much better. So now if I look at my data set, I've now got a missing value for my attendances here. And if I rerun my case statement, this is where it really falls apart. And we look at my groupings now. Now, it is definitely saying that my NA is over 25,000. So the case statement has evaluated this null. It's gone, no, nope, it's not less than 5,000. It's not less than 10,000. It's not less than that, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, by default, it's this, where... That's not strictly true. Um, in fact, that's blatantly false. If we've got a null in there, then it's not a, you know, null is not a 25,000. So uh, it's good practice not to have uh, your default as the else. Well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, as a uh, as a other, if it's not any of these, well, then and assume that it's this because that's really, really poor. What's probably better uh, thing is have your dot .default as an error message so you can be sure that your case statement picks up every eventuality of what it should be pulling through. So if I run that one now, and I look at my data, now I've got my attendances. Now I've got this error message saying error does not compute. 
which is brilliant. Now I can pick that up and, and I can check it. And I can see that where I have got my over 25,000s, which is over here, those are still coming through as my over 25,000. So I know my case statement encompasses every sort of proper eventuality, but where I've got an issue, it's now coming through with, with an error, which is much, much, much better way of doing things um, and very good practice. Oh my goodness, we've got an over to you. Oh my goodness me, this is, oh, this is nasty as well. So what we want to do is write a crazy case statement that basically uh, looks at the type of, so we're going to create, we're going to mutate a new column. If it's a type one, we want to return half the number of attendances. If it's a type two, we want to triple the number of attendances. If it's a type other, quadruples the number of attendances. And if it's not any of those, returns a super suitable error. Okay, and the trick is definitely going to be in the suitable error bit. So I would definitely start with something like copy copy some of that and then uh, adjust it so you don't have to do all the uh, all the bits and bobs. And is there a hint? Oh my goodness me, there is a hint. So there we go. That's the big hint is make sure your returns are all of the same data type. Sorry, look at me checking my team's messages in front of me. Outrageous. Okay, let's have a look at this one. I'm going to copy that because who wants to write all that stuff out then? So we're going to have, I don't know, uh, uh, don't know what we're going to call it, attendance multiplier. I can't spell it. I have spelled it, didn't I? So, so when are, what are we doing? Are, type equals one. We want to return our Tendencies times or point five. So when it's type two, we want uh, attendances times three, and where it's type other, we want attendances times. Four. Ridiculous, I know, but I don't know. You might come up with some sort of use case where you do, do something like that. I mean, sometimes things have different points. The tricky bit is this bit, or potentially. So if we run that one, what have we got? We're not happy because exactly the same as that uh, if else statement. So a case when it's just a fancy if else statement. Our else and our ifs are of different types. So it's saying that our left hand side is a double, it's returning a number, and our right hand side is returning a character. So we need to create a default or a, or an error type um uh number in there. So Quite often I will use something like minus nine 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 because 
there's no way that any of those results would be minus 9999. It's just not possible. So if we look at this one and uh, we look at our data now, we should have this weird attendance multiplier and it's come through. Well, that's interesting. Oh, okay, I'm not doing, yeah, okay. So our attendance multiplier, uh, oh no. So it's looked, it's a type one and it's taken our attendances, which is null and it's times it by 0 0.5 and come up with an NA, so that's fine. Uh, so let's just put in a error as it were. So let's just change our data. Uh, uh, at position three, and we're going to call it. I know it's not going to like it, is it? I'm thinking, oh, let's do it. I'm not sure it is. No, it's not. Damn it. Okay, I'm not going to worry about that now because it's already been set as factors, and I need to reorder, reallocate my packs. However, in the normal world, if I if it if it was any result that wasn't one two or other, it would then default to a minus nine 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 nine, and I'd be able to look on that column and search for my minus nine 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 nines and just double check that my data was correct. This that won't work for this because the types the one two and other haven't been set as characters; they've been set as factors, which we will come to on later on this afternoon. And factors can only once you've set a factor, oh my goodness, I'm not going to go there. We'll talk about this afternoon. Okay, um, you are you're very limited on what you can do. So hopefully everybody has sort of got that one. Um, just go into some nice base R. It allows you to uh do an if statement in base R. So uh, an if statement in base R works a lot differently than the if else statement in dplyr. So dplyr is all about doing it within your data frame and you're looking at your data frame and you're either doing a mutate or a summarize and you're and you're using your if else statement within that same with the case statement. An if statement base r is much more of a sort of how can I explain it? More of a sort of a programmatic way of using an if statement. So you can do multiple things uh within a, an if statement and you can also set up a um it uses curly brackets which we will come to a little bit more of when we do some functions this afternoon but it denotes a scope which is basically a a piece of code that may or may not be evaluated depending on what's what's going on um so it's saying this is a piece of code and it doesn't automatically get run it will be run in various different re reasons and rationales and will have various different effects on the global environment um which will become much more apparent when we do functions later but let's just do a very very quick example here so i'm going to create a variable called a and i'm going to call it 10 so call it 10 assign it 10 so if we look at a the answer is 10 then we're going to do a very, very quick if statement. And we're going to just say, if A is 10, uh, sorry, if A is 5, we are going to do all these things in the curly brackets, um, which is great. So if A, uh, A meets this criteria, do all this stuff in the curly brackets. What we could do is add an else and say, if it A isn't 5, then do all this stuff. Or we can just keep it as a one-sided if statement, whereas it's, it's saying, if A is five, do this, else nothing, don't do anything. Only do this if A is five. So if we run this or just run it through in our head, so if A is five, it will then assign uh, 10, it will make A 10. It will then create a new variable called B, because as you can see, I don't have a value called B. And it will also print uh, the message B has now been created as a variable and is now A. So if we just evaluate it in our heads, A is 10. So is A equal to 5? No. 
So what we should see when I run this piece of code is nothing. As in, it's, it's run the, through the code, it's printed it there, but it hasn't actually run. Ooh, there we go. I don't know why it's in that. Uh, it hasn't actually run that code, which is in the curly brackets. So now if I change that to a five, uh, so now A will be five. And let's see what happens here and when we run that. So now you can see, we can see A is now 10. So literally, as we can see here, Part of my curly brackets was reassigned the value 10 to A. So when I look up here now, I can see my A is 10. Uh, it also says B has been created and is now A. So literally here, it has now created this value, uh, variable B, which is also 10. So that didn't happen when I ran it the first time when A wasn't 5. So it allows you to create these really, really sort of powerful things where if it's this, do this whole bunch of stuff um, and it will affect the sort of the global environment. Otherwise, don't do anything, otherwise ignore it. And like I say, you can also add in else statements after it with additional curly brackets, or you can, and it's horrible, but you can do it. You can sort of nest your if statements and sort of add if a equals seven. Ooh, my goodness me, let's do that. A equals seven, then do this, whatever. Anyway, uh, does that make sense? Let's just go back to how it was. Cool. Oh, look at me. Uh, so, uh, let's say, and it does what it does in the bracket so i've created an a so a is five so this is not okay so this is assuming let me just change this to c because that's not right because b does exist because i've already run that bit of code change that to c so i'm going to run my code this bit of code again and at the moment i've got value of a is 10 so if a is five do this stuff else print a is uh a is and it will give you the value of a and c does not exist so let's just run that one and there we go it says a is a and c does not exist and if i change my a to be five and run that code it should then run that first bit again. Ooh, I, should, I should say C. C is now, and now I've, as you can see, it's created a new variable called C, and it is now A. So raw, uh, raw base R if else statements can be really, really powerful. They can also be very hard to read. So just be really, really mindful about how much junk you put in these uh, curly brackets because it can get quite messy. So there we go. Where are we at? We're at eleven forty. We're doing great. So uh, where are we? Group and mutate to make subtotals. So uh, grouping and mutating. Uh, so we want to create some totals by our organizations by month and bits and pieces like that. So what I want to do is create some percentages. So what? I need to do, say I wanted to create my percentage of attendances. So we've got our data here and we've got our date here. So our, our March uh, 2017 for this organization. So I want to know what were the total number of attendances and also so I want a total column, and I also want to know what percentage of attendances were by group one, uh, by type one, type two, and type other. I'm just going to reset my data again. Um, no, I'm not. Let's keep it messy. It's fine. So I want to create a new title, uh, a new column, which will be my total number of attendances. And also I want to create a percentage of attendances, which will be my attendances divided by the total attendances. And that's going to be grouped by the organization code and the period. So just going back to my data. 
So I'm going to add my, uh, that's obviously not a good example, but I'm going to add my uh, uh, not applicable and my 813 and my 2850, and then divide that by the total to give my percentage. I didn't need to tell you how you have to create percentages. I'm sure you know how to do that. Right. So if we do data talk work, what that has done, uh, it's given me a few wobbles because I've got some NAs in there, but that's fine. We can deal with that in a minute. Um, we can see that here we've got these three here, which is our 30210 plus 807 plus 11352 should be 4369. And then if we do 30210 divided by 42369, it's not a yet. And then that times 100 uh, will give us our percentage. So now we've got grouped percentages by our attendances across each of our organization, each of our organizations for each date stamp. So if we scroll down, we can see that's all the way through. A uh, really good check is just to do a sort by our percentages and just double check we haven't got anything over 100% because that couldn't or shouldn't happen if uh, uh, our thing is right. So that's all good. So uh, let's see if, oh, there we go. That's a nice one. So over to you. That creates a big, long uh, decimal number as a percentage. Can you round it to one decimal place? So we've got our percentage here. Uh, where are we? Down here. In some horrible format here. Can you convert that and round it to one decimal place? So hint, Simon. Oh, look at that. Be mindful of your commas and brackets. Yeah, this is one of those really horrible ones, I'm afraid. And there's no harm in doing it in two stages. So literally, can you do that? Oh, I've got somebody at the door. You've got an extra two minutes. Okay. I'm giving me what's going on. So, uh, what are we doing? What are we doing? Oh, rounding. Oh, rounding, rounding, rounding. So rounds always gets me because it's a horrible cacophony of uh, brackets and and uh, and commas. So there's a round function. And we've got some hideous long number, and we want to round it to one decimal point. Easy peasy. Oh, it's kind of weird how it's. So, yeah, we go. Uh, and we want to round it to two decimal points. Nice and easy peasy, you think. However, we want to add it into, into our percentage bit here, which is where our brackets all go horribly wrong. So the Cheaty simple version, uh, which is I don't know, not terrible, but is completely applicable. 
let's do that. So let's round. And we could do that. So we kind of overwrite our perk attend with a rounded version of the perk attend. And if we look at our total perk thing, uh, oh, no, let's close it and reopen it. I think that's a bit of an our um, cloud thing. It doesn't always refresh the data frames when you sort of come off and on again. And then we you see we've got a bit more of a rounded uh, way of doing it. But obviously that's given us a lot more typing. So can we do it in one go where we're putting functions within functions? Functions within functions is great, but it does cause that absolute horror with um, brackets and commas. So I think what about that one out? Oh, look at that first time. So we still want our round. Our round takes an extra set of brackets. And then we want to put our bit. So we want to put that bit there inside our round function. And then we want to do a comma. And that little dot comma one there is our number that we want to round it by. So basically, we are pasting that bit there into that bit there. And that would that then produces the same as that. Does that make sense? Uh, functions within functions obviously does get a little bit mind blowing, and it does get really really messy uh, sometimes. Backing up my R session, I thought I said barking up my R session. Uh, right, so I didn't go to sleep. Okay, it's uh, waking up again. <laughs> Did everybody get the round function? Did anybody get horribly messed up with brackets and commas? Because I know I do it every single time. If you didn't, you're probably amazing. Uh, Rainbow parentheses. Oh, yeah, I haven't mentioned that. Definitely, definitely check that out. Um, thank you to call Anyesh. Probably include that at some point. So... <laughs> Be mindful of your commas and brackets is, uh, yeah, probably a really good thing. Uh, so let's, uh, let's do a really horrible, crazy, bonkers version, which um not going to go into massive amounts of detail on this. Now this does go into the realms of more advanced, but kind of show it's here for you and by all means come back and nick it at a later date so we want to date our data uh, our data total perk and what we want to do is create a um a percentage column but all our numeric columns and we want to do it all in one go without so on this we've created our uh, our our column and we've done it on one column uh here, oh, where have I got it? I need to get rid of that bit, don't I? Oops. Sorry, I've got rid of that. So I've created a percentage on one column. Um and I've and I've put it there. What I want to do that is in one big go and um without having to do lots and lots of different things. So I want to do create my percentages across all my uh, numeric columns and create that percentage on all my columns and do that in a dynamic way. So I'm going to take my data. I'm going to mutate across, which basically allows me to a mutate across different columns all in one go. And we can use those same select verbs that we used earlier. So potentially, if I wanted to just do a function on all the column names which contain x i could do that or if i wanted to uh, yeah do all those kind of things or if I, I just wanted to mutate these specific columns i could just mention them and, and list them out but in this case i want to look across my columns and where it's numeric then so i'm using my tilde as a then again and I'm basically using a dot because basically where it's found its uh, column, it's going to iterate through them. So the dot is just a placeholder for the column name. 
So where it's numeric, bring it through. And then for the column, you want to do this, divide it. So find a column where it's numeric, get that value of that column, divide it by the sum of that column, times it by 100 to get our percentage. And then also give that column a new name and I will give it a suffix of perk underscore and then the column name, and then I'm grouping it by organization and, and period. That's very convoluted, but if we just run it and then have a look at our data set, what that has done is pretty much exactly the same as we did earlier, hopefully, if it wakes up. Oh my goodness me. Uh, oh my God, I've got all my absolute rubbish on here. Where the heck is that doing? I opened the wrong one. Uh, Data top perk. Weird. Anyway, uh, I have now got my percentage is of uh, breaches. I've still got my attendance multipliers and all that kind of rubbish in there. That's why, isn't it? Um, I've now got a percentage of breaches, admissions, and uh, attendances across each of those groups across each of those different columns. So I've got my attendances, uh, percentage of breaches, percentage of breaches, et cetera. Um, and it's creating a new column and it's called it perk underscore whatever. So I can see that that is the percentages of these. That one is very clearly across this group that makes up 100% of it. So that hopefully makes sense. And what have we got here? We've got a NAN. What have we got nans? Ah, okay. We've got some nans here because what we have got is a zero divided by a zero. And as we know, we can't divide by zero. That's like one of the mathematically impossible type things. So that's come up with a nan. So a nan is stands for not a number. Um, so it's basically, it's not telling you it's an NA, so it's not a null thing. It's not a, it doesn't come through as a null object. It does come through as a, a not a number object, um, which, yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. Uh, we can also use a, a tidy select function. Again, like I said, rather than just the where is numeric, I could say, again, where I we use our contains and we've got a, we've got breaches and we've got um attendances and so anything that contains the es we could do exactly the same and run that and it would just create those new columns based on our tidy select that we've done there i say that's really quite complicated stuff with the tildes and the dots and all of that kind of stuff and as it says it's probably too advanced for now but do come back to it because once you start using it, it will start making a lot more sense. And it's really powerful. You, if you've got wide data that you want to do a whole bunch of operations on, it's it's really cool. Um, so quick note on row-wise operations. So we're just going to do a very, very quick row-wise operation. So we've got our data and we've got attendances, admissions, and uh, attend. What have we got? We've got... Um, why have I got new attendance? Where's that come from? Yeah, that's weird. Uh, and breaches, isn't it? Weird. And I want to know across uh, each of those columns, which is the highest. So if I go back to my data, I've got all of these different things. Uh, across each of these, uh, each row, I want to know which is the highest out of the attendances, breaches, or admissions for for that row. So what we can do is a row-wise operation. And basically, we're just going to say our max column is going to be the maximum of whatever is the maximum of either the attendances, the breaches, or the admissions. So if we look at that one and we go back to our data... Uh, we've got a new max column, which basically should equal whatever, whichever one is the highest out of each of these. So basically, what row wise is is basically a group by each, and each column is its own group. Oh, sorry, 
yeah, each row is its own group. That's why it's called a row-wise operation. Uh, so row-wise, and it's looking across each row and it's finding the max across that row, across multiple different things. So um, yeah, something I've used quite recently, in fact. Uh, where are we? Oh, I've lost that one. That one. So, does that make sense? Sorry, I was uh, getting off the one. So, that's back into our data there. And yeah, so our max ones will bring out whichever ones those. I think in most cases it is our attendances. So, it's not being particularly dynamic, unfortunately. Um, but there we go. What we could do, and probably quite interesting here, is we've got an NA which is called our max column to fail because it doesn't know what to do with the NA. So if we add in uh, NA.RM equals true, oh, that's weird. Oh, why not update it? Can you get that? Yeah, there we go. So now it's ignored that NA and has gone and it's now given me this value here as our maximum. So I'm sure many of you have done that introduction to our course and the NARM throws quite a lot of things. It, it will throw a max um, feature, it will throw a mean, it will throw a sum. So if you've got data which has got nulls in it or NAs, you need to make sure that you appropriately decide what to do with them, either remove them or, uh, or, or whatever. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. Pivot wider and longer. We're going to do this and then you're going to have some lunch where you rock backwards and forwards and cry. So um, now it's pivot wider and longer are fabulous things, um, but it's quite, quite tricky, but we'll be, we'll be fine. Um, so let's just come up with uh, looking at our, our data. So what we want to do is basically pivot uh, which, you know, our friend Excel excels at because you can just click and drag and move things around, and that's really cool. Uh, R, unfortunately, we have to do that by code. If you've ever tried to do um, a, a pivot in SQL, then my condolences to you, you crazy person. Um, yeah, don't ever pivot in SQL. Anyway, R, it's pretty good, pretty good. So... What we want to do, we've got our data here. We've got our organization. We've got our period and we've got our attendances and we've got it all in sort of separate columns like that. But what we want to do is make it wider. So we've got long data here and we want to change that. So we've got one column, one row and new columns called January, February, March. And those are our results. So quite often we we work with long data because that's much, much nicer way of working with data. But quite often when we want to then pop it into uh, a table or human readable, actually putting it into a wide format makes more sense. So dplyr loves long data. Humans love wide data. There we go. Who, who thinks so? Let's uh, let's have a go and see if we can do that with our data set. So first of all, we're going to take our data set and I am going to clean my data set because uh, it's got four tons of mess in there. Actually, I know it's got selected and it. it's fine. I'm going to keep that. There. It's fine. So we're going to take our data set. We're going to filter it down to one uh, organization. We're going to take, filter it down to one uh, type of uh, attendance and a couple of periods. And we're just going to select those three columns, organization code, period, and attendances. And if we look at our data, if I can find it, data-wide. So there's our data. We've got one organization code. We've got a period. We've got attendances. What I want to do is convert my period into column names and have my attendances under those column names. Does that make sense? So let's have a look at it. We've done that. So what we can do quite nice and easily is a pivot wider. So we're going to take our data. We're going to take the names from our new columns. We want to use the, the what's in period. And the values we want to use are our values are from our attendances. So let's have a look and run it, and it will make much more sense. 
So we take our data wide and then we look at it. So now we've got an org name, we've got our our column names, our our, uh, our period, and then our if we go for our values, our, our attendances. So as you can see, what we've lost is attendances as a column name or a feature. We will just have to know that this period refers to our attendances. So pivoting to that round some stuff, you know, you can lose some of the things that you, you chuck in there. So just be aware of that. Oh, my goodness me. We've got an over to you already. That's a bit crazy. So uh, over to you, but do the same with breaches. Ah, oh, that should be straightforward then. Uh, by all means, copy and paste my code and change like a word. That, that's literally what I'm going to do. So you need to make sure that you've also copy the uh, the data set and change it so that it just returns breaches for reasons that will become apparent shortly. And then all we want to do is change our values from its breaches and then we can have a look at that. And there we go. Okay, hanging on in there. So, let's say, remember the phone, blah, 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 blah. Oh, look at that. Bonus points. Can we make the process one pipe? So, uh, I'm sure we can. So, let's just delete that. And chuck in a pipe. So, now, when we run that one... We've got that all in one process. So our data wide now spits that out in one go. So again, wonderful, beautiful things about R about chucking things in pipes and doing things all in all in one go. Cool. Uh, so more complex version. So this time we're going to look at our data again, and we are not going to remove types. We're going to have three different types this time. So if we look at our data wide, as it says on the screen, we've now got our RF4, we've got our period, we've got our attendances, but we've also got a type one, two, and other. So we want to do the same again, but we also want to keep our type data. So let's literally run that same code again and see what that does. So we want to still want to pivot our names we want as our period, and we want our values to be our attendances. But be aware now, like I say, when we look at our data, we've got this extra type. So what does that do? And we look at our data. Oh, nice. Look at that. So we've not specified uh, we've used type or whatever but it knows because it's our super clever that that's going to be a separate group now and now we've got uh, a separate group by type and we've we've made our data wider fabulous yeah okay, simon what is this all fuss about pivoting's easy so let's just try it let's just ramp it up a little bit more so this time we're going to bring back three organization codes we're going to bring back all the types and uh, look at it that way. So let's have a look at that one. So now we've got three different organization codes. We've got various periods and we've got different types for each of those. And again, we want to do the same again. So let's run that same code again and see what it does. So we still want our names from our periods and our values from our attendances. And we run that one and we do data wide. And what has that done? Nice, easy, this, this pivoting's easy, isn't it? Look at that. So now we've got our totals as it were by organization, breaking down by type and then across each of those dates. 
easy peasy. So let's go even cleverer. And this time we're going to bring in our breaches as well. And I don't wide. And we'll look at all that. So now we've got our organization code, and we've got several organization codes. We've got our types, and we've got there's several different types. But now we've got attendances and we've got breaches. Okay. So let's just go with our favorite old uh, lovely pivot wide statement, which has been working fabulously all, all this time. And let's see what that one does. And oh dear, that's not really what we wanted, I don't think. So because we've only specified the values to come from one place, it's done something weird and uh, not what we're after. Well, unless obviously you do want that. Uh, I hope not. So uh, so let's just reset the data and try that again. So reset the data. But this time we want our values. We've got two different things that we want values for. So we've got values for our tendencies and we've got a values for our breaches. So let's have a look at what that does. So this is where it's got, ours gone a really, really clever now. So again, we've given us our little summary. So we've got one row per organization code and one type. But as we can scroll across, ours also concatenated us and made us up some new column names. So we've got attendances for each of those dates. And as we scroll across, we've also now got breaches for each of those dates. So I've done some, some, some clever stuff to split those all out and create us those new column names and, and to do that. As I said, there are ways, oh, I'm not going to go through here, but if you do press F1 on your pivot wider, it, ooh, it doesn't come up with anything. Not allowed apparently um denied that's interesting let's uh let's come back to that later <laughs> uh well, that's scary um pivot wider does do some really really clever things in in that areas there are specific ways to determine how your new column names are are created you can do things in certain orders um you can do lots and lots of different clever things around that um, but I'm just trying to show you the absolute basics so that you can have a go. Do go and have a look at the, the help function for Pivot Wider when it decides it wants to work and not get boss clouded. That's a bit scary. Why is it doing that? Okay. Um, and there are loads and loads of options with Pivot Wider to, to convert stuff into, um, uh, yeah, to, to, to do how you do stuff. So Pivot and Wider relatively straightforward hopefully you can see that's not too bad what's messier and harder is getting wide data and making it long and the reason for that is basically as i touched on as you, as you remember when we have that attendances and we and we made it wider we actually lost that column name attendances it didn't appear anywhere we had values under each of those things but it wasn't specifically uh, an attendance so when we when we get stuff from wide and we want to make it long there's quite often additional things we need to chuck in there and that does make it not as not as easy so looking at my friends in nhs england data services please stop making horrible wide data sets um, anyway moving on so let's start with our basic wide data set again uh, so we'll just run that one again and start with the really, really basic data wide here. So we're just going to have our organization code and our dates and our, and our attendances here. And we want to make it longer. So uh, again, we can use, we, got, we, got, we need to tell Pivot Longer which columns we want to make wider, uh, longer. And that's not so easy. Uh, in principle, we could, because 
you know, we can see it's those, but actually we've got to find a way to describe those those column names. They are going to be strings, so we can't use things like as date because they, uh, a column name will be a string. It will not be a, a, a date per se. So we're going to have to do some sort of identifier around what it is. Um, so I'm using a, a nice little tidy select and I'm using a starts with 20. That would be, I, mean, I could do a contains 20 and that would also work, but I'm just going to use starts with 20 because I know all my dates start with a, a, a 20 on there. Um, then I want to say, what are we going to, uh, what, what would we want our names from? And that's from the names of our period. And what is the new column name which we're going to create? And it's going to be our attendances. So going back to here, looking at our data, attendances does not appear within that data frame. So we're going to move it around. We're going to turn our column name into a, it's going to be called a period. So we want to move that around, turn that into a new column that is going to be called period. And then we're going to turn our, values into a new column which is going to be called attendances um and we do data long and we look at that and that's what we get but as i said doing things that way around is much 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 trickier and and horrible um and i'm sure if we look at data long yeah um just to absolutely confirm where we've moved it around in that way our period now, as you can see, has definitely come through as a character and it's not a date. So just be really, really mindful of those sort of things as well. Anything that you sort of transpose, even if it's got like a number on there, it's going to come through as a as a character if you're transposing those uh, names there. Um, and it says that, not going to lie, pivoting wider is way, 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 way more complicated and not going to go into lots of in-depth examples now because I think that would completely uh, blow your mind. So we are at 12.16. Are there any questions or shall we take, I don't know, 45 minutes and come back at one for some lunch? Uh, have a 45-minute break and come back at one? Any objections? Uh, instead of use, so just reading Sam's thing. So, yep, Sam, just replying to your message. Is there a way of, say, all numeric columns? Um, yes, there is. So we could say if the column contains numeric data, so we could use that, which, uh, oh, my goodness me, which I used in my funky tilde example up here. Think we could do a where is numeric uh think well i don't know what we have to do in a cross i'll have to think about that uh where are we uh, 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 uh. Let's see if that did i do my data one Oh, I've messed up. I've done, 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 done. Uh, 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 uh. Like that? Yeah, okay. Let's look at that. So, yes is the short answer then. Uh, yep, so it has done the same. So, yep, Sam can do uh, where is numeric, and that will tell us, it will then filter, it will then pivot any any columns which are numeric so that's doable really really messy and potentially very dangerous but yeah it's doable anyway um any questions now i'm just going to scroll through the chat if there's anything no cool uh is one o'clock okay for everybody is that any problems with that Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay. 
All right. In that case, uh, I'll take silence as compliance and uh, see you hopefully back at one o'clock. See you in a bit. I think. Yeah. I'll just try and with it. And then do we switch off now or do we leave it running? I can't remember. We leave it running and I'll message Bianca to let her know about the recording. Oh, OK. Give her a timestamp where she can go for it. Yeah. Cool. OK, otherwise, see you at one. Go get some lunch and more coffee and stuff. See you in a bit. Simon, you're Hello. sharing my screen. I scare my screen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for uh, <laughs> stop share. Let's do that. Oh, well, I'm still on camera and everything. Oh my goodness me. Stop video. Cool. Well, no doubt my R has fallen asleep, so let's go. Yeah, there it is. Uh, share screen. Where's that gone? That's there. And share. Cool. Resume. Had a quick look at the chat. There wasn't anything massively uh, in there that screamed uh, of, of anything, which is good. Uh, Anya's been popping little bits and pieces in there as we go, which is awesome. Uh, where were we and what were we doing? That's right, we just did some pivots. Pivots is good. Uh, we are over halfway, which is awesome. So, unless there's any further ados, let's do... Oh, my goodness me. It's telling me I've got a message coming up saying my internet connection is unstable. So, please shout if anything happens. Um, cool. Right. Rolling functions. Let's do some other bits of wrangling and, uh, yeah, some, some useful bits and pieces. So rolling functions. Rolling is a, a classic method of, of trying to smooth out messy data. Uh, one of the classic ones is something like A&E &E attendances, where you've got daily data, which massively fluctuates from day to day. Um, so quite often people look at that on a seven day rolling average to smooth out that sort of weekend peak to try to understand what is the actual trend going on. So uh, the Zoo package has uh, some lovely functions for, for rolling windows, which make uh, that super easy. We haven't got Zoo installed. So again, we can install our package or we can add it to our little bit at the top here. And let's add Zoo in there. And then run this little baby. And it should check that Zoo hasn't been installed and install it for me, although it's been really, really slow, which is interesting. Right, so now I have got Zoo installed and uh, is up and running, and I need to find back where I was. Uh, or alternatively, you can go to Tools, Install, and do it the, the old-fashioned way, and then call the library. Um, I just 
it's like I say, good practice not to have uh, calls for libraries in the middle of your code. You should obviously always keep them at the top so we can sort of see right at the start what's what's going on. And like I say putting it in that little sort of functiony bit is is quite nice. So Zoo has a lovely function for rolling windows. So uh, let's just have a look. So we're going to make a data roll. We're going to filter our data down to our um, a couple of our individual um, sites. We're just going to arrange our data just so it makes it much easier to see by organization code, then by the types, and then by the period. And then we're going to create a new column, which is going to be called rolling. And so we're going to do a mutate. And basically, we're going to use this roll apply. So we're going to apply a rolling uh, average to or I say mean, let's not use the word average, uh, rolling mean to our attendances. We're going to have a window of six, which basically means we're going to look at the, the six data points. That's going to be what we're going to create our mean over. Where we align our mean, so I've got six data points and I'm going to align my mean over. Again, I guess if you imagine our wide data where we've got our data all in a row uh, across the top, and we've got like the oldest data on the left hand side and the newest data on the right hand side, and it's each each one's a column. We want to say our data is going to be aligned to the right, so we're going to take the latest value and look back six weeks or six data points in this case months, and we are going to take the latest data point and look back to the last six. And that's what we're going to use as our mean. What you can do is various different methods, and we'll come to that in a minute. And then also we're going to say, if we haven't got enough um, data points for our six, which obviously is going to be the first five, we're just going to fill that with an NA. So we're not going to include anything. We're, we're just going to put nulls in there. And then we're going to group our data by our organization code and our type. So if we run that one, uh, okay, that's interesting. Oh, I haven't ungrouped my data, which I do believe Anya pointed out earlier that I did a rowwise and I didn't ungroup my data. So I am very naughty. Let me just reset my data. Um, note to self. So and group on row wise Look at that row what okay i need to update that in my training which is all good so i'm just going to reset my data uh bring it back totally to the the original data and then i'm going to do a data now i'm going to run my data roll and again this is where not doing those ungroups can cause you uh, issues unexpectedly, uh, exactly like this one. Uh, I knew I didn't ungroup it for a reason. Um, that was all part of the show, uh, by the way. Uh, I meant to do that, honestly. So if we go back to our data roll now, what we can see, we've got this new column called rolling, and it is the average of the previous uh, six uh, attendances. So we can just double check that. We can do 10967 plus 11812 plus 11817 plus 11817 plus 11 plus 11 there is the average of those guys there where we haven't got the six figures uh the six numbers in there we've um we've ignored it so it starts off with five blanks and then we can see that all that goes through um and we've done that per type and per organize no per organization and per org code and type so we can see that it re when we swapped onto our next org code it's done the same thing it's it's grouped so this one will be the uh rolling uh mean of the previous which is great um and that's a really nice simple roll apply function um there are other really really nice functions within zoo which for sort of like doing other sort of lagged variables um, and uh, various bits and pieces but oh look at this we've got over to you so see if you can change the window to three months 
can you add an additional column which will give the median over the three months instead of the mean? Uh, with the median, uh, see if you can calculate it on the middle time period. So basically, instead of a, a right hand uh, alignment, see if you can sort out in the middle and see if you can replace any of the blanks data where, um, which is going to be the first and the last, because we're going to be looking at a window of three and we're picking the middle. Can you replace those blanks with a 9999, as it says there? Uh, and hint, read your error messages. OK, that's uh, cryptic. <laughs> Always read your error messages. And I think that's one of my big tips for R generally is um, read your error messages out loud. Uh, even if you're on your own in a in a darkened room, there is something sometimes about actually reading the error message out loud that actually tells you what is going on. And sometimes just by reading it, you don't actually see it. The amount of times where it pretty much does tell you spot on what the problem is and how to fix it um is is uh unbelievable and i'm sure you all have done that you know when you're using a single equals rather than a double equals and all of those things where it says did you mean to do this and it's like yeah that's exactly what i did so uh by all means copy the code let's not have to start from scratch every time so see if we can change the window to three months. Uh, well, all the data is monthly anyway, so three months is just changing our six to a three. That should be relatively straightforward. Um, can we change it to a median? Yes, we can. We can change that function to a median. And can we get it to a line in the middle? Uh, Yes, potentially, if we can remember what the word is for middle. Where are we? Align. Options for align should be left, right, or center. So here we go. If we look at our usage, the options are left, right, or center. So we want center. So that was me being cheeky, saying middle. And then we want to fill our uh, differences of our missing values with 999, I believe. Cool. So without a doubt, I can never remember um, the, 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 you know, what are the options for an align. So again, using that help function and going through and looking at the usage and looking at the vignette, really, really cool stuff. So if we look at our data role now, I need to close that and have a look at the new one it's created. We should have a 999 as our first value because that will be the empty one and it also should denote the last value in that group. So yep, we got a 9999 and we should be able to see a 9999 here at the end of that little group. And we're doing the median between these three numbers, which I can see is, uh, yeah. So that 119 is the median of those three and it's put it in the middle. So let's put it here. This one is the median of these three numbers. This one is the median of these three numbers. So again, it's looking one ahead and one behind and of, of itself on its own row. Um, so that's quite a quite a nice uh, function to be able to, to do that kind of stuff. And I'd say you're not just limited to means and medians. You can put any function you fancy in there. Um, so I'm not sure why I got this read your error messages in there. Um, so yeah, you could put max in there, min, all of those type of things, and that would work in there. Um, potentially you could put your own function in there um, and it would it would work, uh, but we'll come to writing your own functions in a bit. Uh, it, very, very simple on data roles. Any, any questions on, on rolling? Sorry, I've just got a limp biscuit in my head now. Right, moving on. 
So uh, row numbers and date manipulation. So we sort of touched on talking about row numbers earlier, uh, but we're going uh, to, to have a look at it now. And we're also going to have a look at date manipulation. So the classic example of this is uh, things like uh, trying to count referral to second contact type stuff. So yeah, that kind of lagged correlation, that, that lag stuff gets really, really quite complicated. Um, so if I'm trying to calculate what is my referral time to my second contact, I need to, first of all, obviously work out what order my contacts are in, give them a row number, give them a, a number of contacts. And then once I've got that, I can, you know, start calculating time. So uh, that's not what we're going to do. What we're going to do very, very simply on this stage is basically just give things a a, a, a row number. So uh, very much a very sequely thing to do uh, around bits and pieces. So we're going to get our data, just going to filter it down to three of the organizations, just so we're not using a massive data set. We're going to organize it by the organization code type and the period. And then we're going to create a new column, which would be called row number. And we're going to use the function row number to give it a row number. And if we look at our data row, we now have um, a row number all the way through, which goes from the top of our data down to the bottom, which obviously at the moment we can see that perfectly matches our index here. Um, so all good. So that's great, but let's try to do something a little bit clever. Let's now uh, do a row number for each organization code so give each of our organizations their own set of row numbers so uh, again with our lovely mutate but this time we're going to do like a group within our mutate so we're doing our data row we're just going to do our, our filter again so the bit that's changed is adding in this dot by org code so now when we look at our data It should start off exactly the same, but as we skip to the next organization code, it's now given that a new number. Fabulous. And obviously, if we wanted to, we could add in multiple things into our buy. So if we want to give it a row number by organization and by uh, type, say. Can we do it that way? I'm just trying to remember. Or do I have to put that in a what's it? Can't remember. Uh little of that data row. Oh, there we go. Oh no, back here. No, wrong one, sorry. Data row, not roll. There we go. And that has given it a row number. I know it hasn't because I haven't. Yep. Yeah. So I do need to put that into a list to do that one. So I'm grouping my multiple things. And now when I look at data row, I should have a set of row numbers per organization and by each of the types. So when the type changes, there we go. I also got I got an RJ one and I've got a set of row numbers for that. And when it's RJ two type two, that also starts off a new set of row numbers. Fabulous. So uh, that's good. That just gives it a straight row number. Doesn't take anything else into account. So if you've got um, things that are matching, um, obviously this is a time series data set, and we've purposely arranged it by the time period. If it was not in time period order, it would just basically give it a row number based on the 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 where it is within the data set. So if we didn't organize it by period, it would just give it the next number depending on how the data set is 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 ordered. Um, what we can do is use things like rank and a dense rank. So if we want a row number per date. Let's have a look at what that one does. Yeah. Um, see if I can remember. So for 
each date it is given a row number so we have got the 4th of april is one and then may is two and then june is three etc etc so it's given each date its own row number uh which again is, is quite a useful thing to be able to do so it's grouped it by that area um what we can also do um what have i got here Oh, good, good, good grief. Yeah, this was an absolute nightmare. This has came out from something that somebody asked. So they asked, could I give a row number per date, but in reverse order? So normally what you would do is put a minus in front of the variable, a bit like we showed earlier, and it would rank on its inverse, which is great. However, you can't inverse a date. So dates... There isn't like an inverse of a date. So if you ordered something that was one and then you wanted to order it by, you know, if you had one, two, three and you wanted to, you wanted to inverse the order, so you do minus one, minus two, minus three, and it would go by that order. You can't do that with a date. So I sort of came up with this absolutely bonkers uh, row number, which was ordering the dense rank in reverse and then turning it into an absolute value, which was a little bit bonkers. Um, but it did work. So like I said, not going to go massively into the use case for this, but if we look at the data row now, um, what that has done, it's gone backwards. So it's starting, yeah, it's just basically starting backwards and has given our latest state the highest number and then it sort of counts down obviously the the hard bit with that is is you know r doesn't know where to start from so it doesn't know to start from 12 to go to one obviously it's much easier to count to one until you run out of things so that's why i had to do this kind of weird 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 absolute uh descending dense rank period nonsense um but anyway so please don't ask stupid questions like that anyway um what we can also do is a uh, row number per date. So we can do a minimum, uh, a min rank function, which uh, basically does, jumps the missing. So this does, what does this do? Let's have a look. Easy to explain it when you can see it. Is where you've got those ties, it, it basically jumps those and goes on to the next thing. So it's a bit like where you've got gold, gold, and then it jumps to bronze because you've got two golds and we, we're not going to do a silver. So therefore we go on to, on to bronze. So we've got six uh, ones. And so the next thing will be seven. Uh, we've got six, seven. So the next one is 13. I'll just see if we've got one where it's not that. Uh... Or they all sixes. That's really annoying. I should probably come up with a better example. Um, but yeah, basically it does that sort of ranking number where if you've got ties, it will give all the ties the same number, but then skip those onto the next one. Whereas if we did the more um, normal rank function, that would still those would still be all the number ones, and the next lot would be number twos. <gasps> I said number twos. Right. Anyway, moving on. So. Let's uh, move, remove a, a, a year and then check the number, row numbers on the new data set. So here we're going to do uh, something a little bit funky. So we're going to take our data and then we're going to use a between function, which is a really nice little uh, sort of filtering function. Very, very similar to the Excel version. Um, so Excel version, uh, SQL version. Uh, where you can sort of search between things. You can search between um, uh, whatever you fancy as far as numbers and, and dates. And basically, we want to say we want to filter our, our data uh, where it's between these two dates. But what we're going to do is put an exclamation mark in front of it, which will be a negation of our filter. So basically, we want to fit, not filter where it is this year. So we're going to remove a year. I sort of hope that makes, that makes sense. So if we look at just running that section and we look at our data row, what hopefully we should see is, no, what kind of year I removed now? Uh, 2018, wasn't it? 
Uh, if I put it in period order, if we scroll down, we get 2017. And then, as you can see, 2018 has mysteriously disappeared. So it's no longer in our data set. So we've removed a year in the middle of a data set. One of those weird things that you might have to do for some reason or other. Um, <clears throat> not entirely sure why, but you might do. But if we remove that year and run that whole piece of code, and we've still done it by our organization, and we've given it by type, and we go back to our data row. Uh, as you can see, just because we removed that year, uh, X, uh, sorry, R doesn't care. It's still just going to put it in the appropriate order and just skip that year. Doesn't matter. It's still going to give it the normal row number as expected. Cool. Uh, so, like I said, that explanation mark is awesome, as it says here. So, for instance, you could add it in front of the organization codes here, and it would filter all the organization codes which aren't those. So, I want to I want to bring back the data, all the data, up except these, which is which is again sometimes that's the way around you want to do things, depending on what your data set is. Sometimes it's easier to say what you don't want rather than what you do want. Um, and again, like I say, with this not org code, and let's like say you can do this in, so you can specify a few things. I just don't want those few little things, but I want everything else rather than having to list out, I want the everything else. Um, just, just makes things a little bit quicker and nicer. Um, definitely worth commenting that's what you've done though, because I know when I read back to my code, sometimes sometimes you miss there's that little exclamation mark there. So it's worth pointing out in your in your code. So what have we got? Uh, we've all gone over to you. God, this is a horrible one. How have we done? How have we jumped to this one already? Uh, adjust the code to remove the financial year 2017. I think I might have uh, gone a little bit too mad for this one. Um, adjust the code to remove the financial year 2017. Only remove the first three years, first three rows of type one for each organization. Bonus points remove the last rows for each. And we can have done financial years for you guys. That's a little bit mean. Um, hmm. okay, let's see. Um, Forget the financial bit. <laughs> I reckon it's probably fair. I mean, I'm going to do financial years next. So um, financial year is a bit mean. Just do the year. So just the code above to remove the year 2017. Uh, return only the first three rows or only type one for each organization. Bonus points return the last three rows only. Like, that doesn't make sense. Don't know. I think I muddled up there. I think forget the bonus points bit. Mm -hmm. Right. Remove 2017. Ah, there we go. Is there a hint? Oh, there's a hint. Okay. I think that's what I'm after. Uh, 
there. Okay. So I think the object of this exercise was to blow the minds of our SQL users in that you can use another filter down the line in your pipe. You're not, it's, it's not like SQL, you are limited to your select where group by whatever those other bits are. I can never remember. I think that's it. I know there's a, yeah, whatever. Uh, where you can only use each of those verbs more or less once in your little uh, in your query, whereas uh, we can we can run this bit to get our data row, uh, which obviously gives us all our data with all of our row numbers. But then we've already filtered our data here, but we can just add in another filter at the end. We're not limited to you know just just using a a, a function once. So yeah, I think that's quite a, a powerful thing. And if you just really come with that SQL mindset, that's uh, that's quite mind blowing. Um, so cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Sorry about the uh, the original blurb there. I will go back to change that. So grouping by dates. So grouping by year and getting totals. So obviously our our data at the moment is all monthly. Uh, what we would like to do is get a yearly total of our admissions. Um, obviously, quite often you might have daily data and you might want to uh, aggregate up to weekly or you might want to aggregate up to monthly. And then, yeah, sometimes as per this instance, we want to aggregate up to a year data. And I think actually in this bit, I do actually talk about financial years and we want to we want to create a financial year total. So... Uh, so we probably need to do that bit before we do the previous bit. Okay, that makes sense. So let's have a look at how we can add in a year to our data. So we've got our um, we've got our filter. Oh, look at this! I've done it. An old. I've still done it old school, which is very naughty. Um, but that's fine. I don't know. There's a reason for it because I'm adding a year. Then in there, yeah, that makes sense. So, sorry, gibbering. All right, uh, so data year, we're going to filter it down to one organization and one type. So, if we just run that, um, just have a quick look at it so we know what we're dealing with. We've got now just the monthly data for one organization for one type, and I think we just want to get the uh total numbers of admissions breaches and i think for some strange reason we're getting the median number of uh admissions just because just because we can that's why um so what i want to do is create a year total so what we're going to do we're going to group by so we, we've got a group but i want to convert my period into a year so floor date, basically, uh, floors a date um, to a sort of specific period. So if I do uh, sys.date and we do today, there we go. We've got today's date. If I do floor uh, date, today's date and do... I think we can do month, if I remember rightly. That will floor it, floor the date to the start of the month, which again is a really nice way if you've got lots of uh, group or, or lots of monthly data in individual days, you can convert it all over into one day so that you can then group it. I can also use that to floor it to a year, which basically pulls it to the first uh, first of whatever year it is. So that's what I'm going to do. So I want to group it by the year. So I'm converting my period into the 1st of January of whatever year it is. And then I'm also, a bit like what we did in our tidy select, um, uh, in our select statements, I'm going to give it a new name. So I'm sure when you've seen... Um, uh, summarizes and group buys before it's it doesn't always give it a, a, a 
a decent name. So we're going to do that. And then we'll try and create an Armenian. If it's, it's going to take a really long time because it's telling me I've got connection issues. Hopefully I'm not falling off. And then if we look at our data year, now we should have today maybe. Uh, there we go. We've got a year total, which has given this a new column name. And we've got a, a year. So it's 2016, 20, it's a little about 2017, 2018, 2019. And it's given us our totals for the year, uh, which is quite nice. Obviously, if we had daily data, we could put the individual days and, and turn that into monthly data, et cetera. So that's pretty cool. Uh, here we go calculating a financial year so um so here's a here's a messy bit so let's find our financial year so, so again we're going to be using a bit of our of, of our uh we're going to use a year go back uh probably it's today's uh it might give today's date today or it might just be uh come on Ooh, sorry uh uh, try logging in and again. Okay, I'm just going to do a refresh and see if that does the job. Uh, am I breaking up lots? Okay. uh sorry i'm just changing the wi-fi is that coming through better now yeah yeah thank you thank you sorry about that and obviously this wasn't happy either so that's how you do it uh right let's go back to where it was uh i was doing my sys date and that got me uh my my thing what you can also do is pull out parts of a date so by using the month function that will give me five which is obviously equivalent to um the month i can pull out my year which will give us my 2024 and i'm sure this will be of no surprise if i put in day it will give me my 14 as my day so in order to calculate my financial year i basically need to know what month it is so my month is, if it's greater than or equal to four, which is April, then my financial year is the year plus one. So uh, if I look at this, so my if I look at today's date, if my month of my period is greater than four, so yes, it is, it's five, then my year period is my year plus one, which will be 2025. So that will say that my financial year is the 2025. Um, if it's not, so if it's less than that, so if it's March or earlier, then it will be 2024. So we're just going to use our um, function to give us our, our financial year. That, that makes sense. So let's just run that across here and we can see what that does. The date finance, and we look at our data. So we can see that, uh, make sure it's ordered. We can see that uh, April 16 is financial year 2017. And then when we get to April 17, that then flips over to uh, 2018. We could do a nice little um, if else statement to split that out or a paste statement to make it much prettier than that. Um, but 
we we could yeah we that that sort of makes sense so that will give us our financial year so now we've got an over to you uh so create a data frame that contains a summary of sites rf4 and rq3 returns the maximum number of type one attendances across those sites by financial year yes that's a ridiculous question well yeah so we want to know for the financial years across type one attendances what were the maximum number of attendances for RF4 and RQ3? So hopefully using a bunch of stuff we've already done. I'll give you two more minutes actually because that's quite a chunky boy. Anybody got it so far? So let's never reinvent the wheel. So let's nick what we can. Uh, so we want to use our in. We got RF four. Oh, let me brackets and RQ three. Lots more speech marks and type equals one. And then, yeah, let's literally nick that to so our financial year. And then what we're we doing, maximum attendances. So summarize max attendances equals max attendances. So uh, anybody get anything vaguely similar to that? Anybody not get that? So nobody got it and nobody didn't get it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okie dokie. Uh, so let's have a look at some stuff. So um, maybe where well, we're cutting up strings and passing numbers. Okay. So maybe we want to extract some weird stuff from our data, and this probably isn't the bestest example. But as we can see within our data set, 
we've got this organization code and it's got a number in it. So we've got RF4, we've got some ADs, 913s, etc. Just say for some reason, and don't get me, uh, I've no idea what this reason is. We want to know and we want to pull out just the number from from that organization code. So we can use, where are we? I have gone strangely weird. Where are we? Blah, 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 blah. We've done all that. So we want to pull out just the uh, just the number from our organization code. So we can use this pass number function, which we have to feed in a character. At the moment, our organization code is a function. So we need to convert that into a, sorry, is, is a factor. So we need to convert that into a character. And we just need to tell it what to do with our NAs. It's also telling us we've got a bit of a warning that some of the numbers have failed because some of the um, some of our organization codes don't contain numbers. So let's just have a quick look at our data org code number. And we can see that our RF4, it's pulled out the four. We've got our R1H, it's pulled out the ones. Our ID is pulled out the 913. And obviously where we've got just got our RQMs, it's come back with nothing at all. Uh, quite a useful function for some things. Um, sometimes if you've got, um, I saw somebody use it for NHS numbers where the NHS number was stored as NHS number and then the number and they just wanted to pull the number out and yeah, things, things like that, which is really, really cool. Or sometimes if you've got things where people filled in like manual surveys and things and they've put like telephone numbers or something like that in there and they've written like tell number at the start or something like that and you just want to pull out the number. So there are some reasonable-ish uh, use cases of, of where that is. Um, what we can also do, uh, and I think we probably covered this slightly earlier, is some fancy filtering, which we, we did earlier, where we using our string detect to work out our org code and whether it contains uh, uh, an R or whether it contains a P. And again, using our sort of up and down, uh, our, our whatever we want to call it, our line to denote an OR. So if we look at our data filt, this should contain any R, any organization that code that contains an R or a P. There are fancier ways of doing string detect using reprex where you can specify uh, sort of strings and wildcards around exactly what you want to do. So if you're looking for any organization code which has got an R as the third character, you can set up a, 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 a use something called Reprex, which allows you to then do that kind of matching and, and searching. I'm not going to go into down because it's really complicated and uses lots of characters. I'm going to have to remember what they all are. Um, but you can do that and you can say it does the really complicated potential matching. So you can say, no matter how long the string is, is the second from the last thing in this string a number four? And you can write reprex, which will tell you, you know, which will bring back that kind of thing, so which, is, which is really cool. Um, so let's have a look. This is a, probably a very strange example, but can you uh, watch organizations have a number in them over 50? Uh, can you return a data frame with just the organizations with a number over 50? OK, well, that should be straightforward enough. Um, I don't think that's even worth particularly dwelling on because we've already got that there. I think it's as simple as that, isn't it? I, I say that, it's my own thing, isn't it? But uh, <coughs> there we go. And then we can see all the ones which have got a number greater than 50. Uh, which is relatively useful, I guess, because all the hospitals uh, have got like an R1K type code, and these are all the other type providers. So if they did follow a certain um, specific type of, yeah, if we look at our raw data, 
we can see our normal hospitals, as it were, our providers have got RF4 codes, whereas if we were looking for something that doesn't follow that type of um, criteria, then actually using that pass number does allow us to identify those which are different, um, which is quite cool. So that's good. Oh, yeah. So we're going to do a little bit of cutting up some strings. Um, obviously, a string is a... Uh, 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 a set of characters. Um, I'm sure you've noticed uh, in our studio that we have this little gr faint grey line here. Um, that's the line of your good code should not cross this line. Um, obviously, you can't really avoid it when we've got strings, but generally, what that that's what that line's for. So, if you're writing code which goes over that line, it means you've uh, done something wrong. Which is why we don't write code like this and put it all into sort of one one big long line. I mean, obviously that will work. There's nothing stopping that from working. It's it is sound code. Um, but you know, we, we we don't do that because that becomes really hard to read if somebody's gotta go and and see what's going on there. So we always, if we can, uh Right, night neat code and uh, try to try to sort out as, as much as possible. And as you can see, when you press return, ours really nice at uh, or our studio is really good at styling your code and, and getting that sorted. Anyway, we are going to write a really long uh string, which is our example, uh, which is here. This is an example, it's a really long sentence, which I like to shorten as it's very far too long. Classic example of this, uh, especially if you work in NHS England, is the way our providers' trusts are stored within our data sets. It will be NHS, uh, NHS Hospital Cornwall Teaching Hospital Southwest Trust Foundation Trust or something like that. And it will be this massively long name for a foundation trust which i just want to be called Cornwall because there's only one or, or whatever and you get this massively long name or you get sort of like uh, uh, going back to my old provider you have like north devon and barnstable community rehab such and such a team or something and it's like i just want to shorten that down to north devon or something like that so you know, that's what it's colloquially known as, but in the system, it's got this long, evoluting name. So what we can do, we can uh, shorten things by characters. So we can get our a substring of our example, and we can just do our start and stop. And basically, we can just pull back the first 15 characters of our string, which is kind of cool. But then this just says this is an exam and nobody wants an exam because that's really horrible. So let's not do that. Uh, so that's using a substring. We also have this lovely function called uh, works with strings much better. One thing I always muddle up between substring and word is that substring uses start and stop. Word uses start and end, which is a bit annoying. Uh, and it also asks you for what is the separator between your words. In this instance, we've got a, a space is separating our words as is per normal, um, but you can specify it to other things. And what that will do is bring back the first four words of a um, uh, a string. And literally, if we wanted to change that to you know bring back the I don't know the third to the seventh letter. An example of a long, there we go. Uh, you can use word function to cut up strings in, in various different ways. And that's really useful, especially if you've got like a prefix on a set of things and you just want to remove it, you know, you can just drop that first word. Or if you've got, you know, NHS Foundation Trust at the end of all your stuff and you just want to drop those last words, you can, you can do that. So we're going to have a go at... Uh, 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 removing some hideously uh, horrible name. So here we go. We're going to have Boggins University Hospital NHS Trust. It's going to be our long hospital name. And we want to change that to Boggins Hospital, uh, which is which is cool. I'm going to use something called the TM library. 
uh, which is probably not the best. This is like absolutely overkill for this kind of task. And I'll just be using one thing out of it. But it does then show some other great function. TM is a fantastic text mining um, sort of data science type library where you can do all sort of sentiment analysis and free text analysis. And like I say, we're, we're using a tiny little function, a little tidy function, tidying function of it. Uh, not its full power of what it's actually capable for. It's it's kind of embarrassing that we're using it for something so so poor, but it doesn't matter. We're going to do it anyway. Uh, so we're going to add our TM to our list of packages up here, and we're going to run that. And again, it's only going to check through for anything that's not installed. So we've already got Janitor installed, so it's not going to reinstall it. It knows it's, it's already installed, so we're just going to load in TM. And then we're going to call it, and it will be good. But yeah, TM's a fantastic package for uh, natural language processing and uh, doing very, very funky things with textual data. And like I say, we are absolutely doing overkill for uh, what is required. Um, alternatively, if you do want to do it there, you can do your install packages and do your TM if you can spell tm correctly and do uh, an install and and then you can just call the library there so what we want to do is remove words from our hospital name so basically the tm's got a lovely little function called remove words and pretty much does what it says on the tin it's going to take a string and it's going to remove those words so let's have a look at that if we do short hospital name and then we look at our new hospital name what does that look like uh kind of cool ish it's a start it's removed the words unfortunately it absolutely literally removed the words and has left the spaces um so without a doubt this is my favorite function uh name in the whole world which is called string squish uh which basically takes a horribly, horribly um, grammatically wrong spaced uh, string and corrects that. So let's run it through our string squish. And it will remove any sort of trailing spaces and where we've got these like double spaces in between and our sort of trading spaces. It will then uh, remove those and we've now just got our boggins hospital which is great and uh, that, that's much better uh which is looking good apart from uh it's it's well let's say not quite there let's say we've done it on an individual hospital uh, an individual hospital as it were to remove those names we can do all of this to a data frame as well so if we had a data frame and it had a load of hospital names we could do it in a mutate and change our data frame and use sort of all these sort of string functions in that. Um, I just didn't have a good example. So we're really close, but I'm sure you've noticed we've got this little rogue capital P in our hospital. So time for a bit of Google foo. Can you find a string function to fix it? So can we change Boggins Hospital to Boggins Hospital, but with a, uh, a, a lowercase p? How would we do that? So over to you. So Google is your friend. 
Anybody found it? So let's get our short article name. String to title, fantastic. There we go. So short article name, and we can do that. STR to title, short article name. Ta-da, and that fixes it. Basically, it just takes each each left each word and capitalizes it. Uh, we can do things like st string to lower, and I'm sure that will be of no surprise. That will convert things into lowercase. <laughs> Even more of a shock, uh, we can do a string to upper, which will make it all shouty. Uh, we can do string to sentence, if I can spell sentence correctly, uh, which we'll put it in sentence format, so only the first thing will be uh, uh, sent. Uh, we can, string to sentence also does really clever things if you've got like full stops and things that will work out that your what your sentence is and do all those sort of things as well, such as that. Anyway, so cool, that's that. Uh, how are we doing for time? We're at two o'clock. All right, we'll do about another. Uh, where are we? Yeah, half an hour or so, and then we're we'll take a break. Unless anybody's, yeah, we only came back at one. We're fine, fine. Okay, introduction to factors. So I've talked about factors before, or we've at least mentioned them, and we've seen in our data set we have got some factors. But what is a factor? So basically, uh, a factor converts our data set into a ordinal data set. So classic uh, bit would be um, sort of low, medium, and high. So low, medium, and high are kind of concepts. And if we were looking at the words, they are what they are. Um, but if we wanted to categorize things into low, and then to medium, and then to high, what a factor would allow us to do is actually tell R this is the order that they come in. So low is below, comes before medium, medium comes before high, and then high is that, you know, it puts an order, so two, two things, uh, where we otherwise wouldn't have an order. So low, medium, high type things are, are, are classics. We are gonna re-explore our attendance grouping. So should have brought this back down in the code if i can try to find where on earth our attendance grouping is uh my goodness me that was like years ago we did that there we go so let me uh do my data and yeah that's the correct one there isn't it so around about line uh 583 you should have some correct data we run that on there and add our attendance groupings onto our data set. So make sure you've got that on there. <laughs> I'll pop that into the chat in case anybody can't find the right one. So if you want to reset your data, let me uh, do a little look. Try to find back where I was. Where are we? That, da, 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 done all that. Here we go, right. So if we want to reset our data, we can do data is AE attendances. Oops. Uh, and then we can add in our attendance groupings again. Oh, and I want a less than, greater than, equals to. Oh, no, actually, I want to do... Yeah, no, I do want a greater than equals to. Isn't it? And I'm going to be really pedantic. Oh, no, let's keep it as that. That's fine. Uh, yes, we'll keep it. I know that's technically wrong, and it should say 25,000 and over, but I'm going to keep it as that for reasons we will come to in just a second. Uh, okay, so... Let's have a look at our data. So we've got our data. 
and we're going to filter it down to just one period and one type and we're going to arrange it so reorder it by our attendance grouping and if we go to our data fact now what we can see is we've got our attendances here which is our 10,000 and we can see we've got our 10 to 19 uh, then it's gone up to the 20,000 to uh bleh. And then it's done 5,000 to 9,000, and then it's done less than 5,000. So quite clear, though, even though we said arrange it by our attendance grouping, it has, and we've got this over 25,000 at the end. Hopefully you can see what it's done is it's basically attendance grouping is just a string and it's just put them in alphabetical order. Um, so that's why we've got the one, it's evaluating that one at the front, then our one five, then our two, then our five, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get onto the letters. So it's done L and then it's done O. So actually that attendance grouping, by ordering it by attendance grouping, it's not actually ordered by that. It's just ordered alphabetically by what we've called it. So let's just do a really super simple plot to uh, show what that looks like uh, in, in awful format. So if I was going to do a plot and it's going to it's going to order it by our attendance grouping, as you can see, it's it's put our attendance grouping in alphabetical order again. Not what we want to see, because, you know, what we would like to see is a a beautiful plot where everything's in the in the right order even though obviously that's that's you know not what it's done so we want to change our data set into an ordinal data set so we're going to take our data uh factor and we are going to mutate and we're going to, we're going to mute our attendance grouping into a factor of our attendance grouping and then we're going to give it levels which basically tells us this is the order that these things come in. Uh, so yeah, I didn't change what it's called because yeah, it comes in later. So I'm gonna rerun that one or run that one. And that's now given us orders. Now, when we look at our data fact, what we will see is this attendance grouping now, now comes with this, it's no longer just a character, which had I shown you earlier, it would have been just a, a character. Now it's coming through as a as a factor. So it's a different data type. So again, if we run that exact same plot again, as I said, I've kept it as, as minimal as we could possibly get. And we run that and we do a zoom. We can now see it's put those in order and it's put them in the order correctly as per the size, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, likewise, if we uh, go back to our, let's just close. Oh my goodness, now I get so many of these open up. I've done that much rubbish. Uh, likewise, if we go back to our data here, where we want to arrange it by, uh, yeah, if we go back to our data fact here, actually, it's the best way to do it. And now if I click on my attendance grouping, it is actually now going to order it by my attendance grouping. So where I've got my 25,000, then I've got my 20, my 15, so I've ordered it backwards. And you can see it has actually put those in order. So I've created an order for, uh, like, again, really, really useful if you've got things like teams that you want to show in a certain hierarchy, or you've got IOCBs in a certain region and you want to group them all up in together and have them in a specific order uh, all of those kind of things changing your data into factors can be really really cool for, for, for that kind of thing um, there are other things that you can do with factors but I think those are sort of the biggest biggest quickest easiest use cases around that and um, there are lots of other bits and pieces that you can do and you can create sort of um other uh, mm. factors for your data you can reorder a factor based on another variable if you wanted to so if you wanted to 
I don't know, reorder your uh, habits so that, I don't know, if you want to order by the highest number of attendances and then have a list of just the, I don't know, the the the, the organisations that have got the highest, that, or you wanted to list your just your organisations by the number of um, attendances or something, you could give them that in the background and then use those factors elsewhere. But yeah, you can do lots of other things with them. Just give them the service and hopefully you can understand now what, what they are. It does mean, however, that if we've got, if we try to add to our data set something that's not a factor, is not one of these levels, uh, R will throw a wobble and it will say no. So I think I encountered that earlier where I tried to inject a new um, a new type into the data set in order to create an error somewhere else. And R said, no, you can't because it's it's not in one of these levels. So now I can't I can't add a new level to I would have to refactor my data if I wanted to add, add a level to it. So you can't just and so yeah. So once you've created that ordinal data set and you've told it what those levels are, those are sort of set in stone until you sort of reorder them again or re refactor them. Ugh, anyway, hope that made sense. Um, so very, very quick introduction to dynamic text. I would shout out to a wonderful tutorial and a much better version of this, which I did in uh, a Coffee and Code session a couple of months ago. And there's a fabulous repo around that and goes into far, far, far better details of this. So if you're writing a report and you want to write dynamic text um, that sort of accompanies your, your charts and things and your analysis, uh, there's a fantastic repo and I will link to it. And it's a really, really good uh, sort of coffee and code we ran the other day uh, around how to do uh, code. And I also use the glue package which is much nicer than paste. I'm looking back at this, this is quite old stuff. So uh, it doesn't go into a lot of detail. And I think I cut a load of it last night. So um, anyway, so maybe we just want to do a very, very quick paste job. And we want to pull out what was the maximum number of attendances. And we want to create that into uh, a, a piece of text. So we are going to take our max of uh, our data number of attendances, which is here. We've got our 32,209, and we want to add that into like a sentence so that we have uh, want to create a variable which has got a mix of, of stuff. So what we can do, we can do is paste zero uh, and add in some text and then this value. So now when I look at my text, it comes up, the answer to that, you know, the, the value behind that text is the maximum number of attendances was 32,009. So let's say you can mess about and, and add text and, and variables, et cetera, into, into text. Uh, let's just do another quick example there. Maximum number of attendances were 32,000 and the lowest was one. I'm all for writing really, really nice narrative to go to with your reports. Um, let's say the, the the repo talks about how to use standard deviations, how to use more English language. So you, you can say this was the highest, this was the second highest and, and create all manner of really, really nice, easy to read analysis to go or, or you know, data, text to go alongside your analysis. Anyway, so where are we? Uh, we are at quarter past two. Cool. So very, very quick intro into SPCs. Uh, this was, like I said, this is one of my uh, sort of intros into how I got into R. We didn't have a, a plot the dots package at the time. So this is very much using the making data account rules um, to create uh, SPCs. I had to do it old school way when I started, but... Uh, Thankfully, a bunch of us got together and we created a, a, a function, which obviously is now up on CRAN, and it's part of the NHSL community, and uh, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful package and fully recommend using it. So I'm not going to scroll all the way up to the top again. I'm just going to go old school and do NSSR, dot the dots, and install that, and then call it. So what the plot the dots library does is pretty much what it says on the tin uh, creates sort of SPC charts. Um, 
so not going massively into what is an SPC, but I will do very, very quickly. So an SPC chart is looks, looking at a statistical process or a, a KPI or something, and it tries to understand whether what your what the metric is, is, is it deviating from the norm? So classic example is your walk into work takes you 10 minutes. Sometimes it takes you eight minutes, sometimes it takes you 12 minutes, but on average, it takes you about 10. And we can therefore put some nice bounds around, well, you know, we think for sure it's going to be within these sort of limits. This is your sort of, based on your current performance of how you've how long it's been taken, this is roughly how long we think it's going to take you to go into work. So therefore, if one day it suddenly takes you, I don't know, 30 minutes, we go, whoa, that's outside your expected kind of values. Something weird's going on there. Uh, and then we can say, wow, that's a special cause. And we can see it's outside our expected limits. And we can see, wow, something's going on. We can also see things like, um, you know, if it's taking you between sort of 10, you know, eight to 12 minutes, and your target is, is that you've got to get into work within 20 minutes, we can go, yeah, we're pretty assured. You know, your average is 10. Sometimes it takes you eight, sometimes it takes you 12, but the targets you've got to be in by 20, we're pretty sure we can be pretty confident you're meeting that target, fantastic. However, if your target was, you know, you've got to get into work by 10 minutes, then we'd be like, well, yeah, you're meeting it sometimes and you're not meeting it others. We we, we haven't got assurance you're consistently meeting this target, We you know, not you're not not good and likewise if your target was you got to get in work within two minutes we're saying well even on a good day it's taking you eight minutes or seven and actually we've got no assurance at all that you're going to meet the two minute target whoa you need to you need to do something different you need to get a faster bike or get a get a skateboard or, or something so it's a really really good quick and good way of analyzing data to know when we've got outlying features and also have we got assurance around whether you're meeting target. Anyway, there you go, plot the dots uh, explained in two minutes. So what we want to do is create ourselves uh, an SPC plot. So we're going to take our data and we are just going to filter it down to one organization and one, uh, one type. So if we look at our data that we want to chuck into our SPC, uh, what? Ooh, where am I going? Over here, that's what I'm doing. We want to chuck this data into our SPC. So we've just got one uh, organization code and we have got what type. So what we want to do is use our plot the dots function and we're going to use the most minimal value uh, method that we can use where we're just going to use our value field as our attendances and our date field is our period. And we run that one through. And at the very, very, very simplest level, it's plotted out us an SPC chart. So this is our daily uh, or our, our monthly data. As we can see, it's pretty variable. We've got our control lines. So our control lines are we are we're pretty confident that our performance is going to be between these lines. We haven't got any uh, any points which are outside these lines. So we haven't got anything outrageous going on. We haven't given it a target. So we're not going to talk about uh, whether we're achieving target or not. We're just we're just looking at sort of activity as it were at this stage. So at the very most simple way of pulling through an SPC chart, we've managed to do that in sort of, uh, where are we, sort of one, what, two lines of data uh, code, which is awesome. So over to you. Uh, what we want to do is add in a target of 17,500, uh, which is our target. And we want to show that an improvement is uh, when data is low. So we want to lower the number of, um, uh, of, of attendances. That's what we're looking at. So uh, we've already got our data, which is here. So we just want to amend this section here. So over to you to work out how to do it. So we want to add, it, add in our target and we want to show that the improvement direction is we want as low as possible. 
obviously sometimes when it's like percentage achievement we want as high as possible so we want to achieve as as high as possible so uh, an spc can sort of flip either either way um yeah i think f1 is your friend here So if we click on our plot the dots SPC function and press F1, hopefully it won't get blocked this time, which is nice. And it gives us some ideas around uh, what we've got as, as options. So we have got, well, we've got a target. So we've got a target option. So let's do target equals 17.50. And then improvement direction equals, uh, what did I say? Uh, reduction, so decrease. Now, if we run it, um, our chart's slightly different. So obviously the, the main bit of data is the same, uh, but now we've got a red line, which is our target line. Based again on our performance, we can say that you know we we think we're doing here. These are our lines of our. We think the highest number based on our current uh, sort of performance is going to be here, and that is way below the target. So actually, we're really confident that we are achieving our target without without any issues, which is a new thing for the NHS. Hooray! <laughs> which is awesome so you know really really good if we had a a target line which was in between our our uh, control limits then we would go well we're not really sure sometimes we're going to hit it sometimes we're not it's going to be really hit and miss we've got no assurance that we're gonna gonna meet it and say if our target was that we had to get below ten thousand, for instance Based on that data, we would say, actually, we've got no assurance we're going to meet that target at all. Um, yeah. So, again, it's a really good way of getting away from have we hit target this month type stuff, um, which the NHS is is dreadful at. So, big wavy flag for, for making data count. So, now we want to do the same, uh, but we want to create a chart for each attendance type. So at the moment, we we created this this plot, and it was for just one attendance type. Um, so let's just pull our data through again, but this time we're going to have uh, data for each different attendance type. So we've got our types one, two, and other. So we want to do exactly the same as we kind of did previously, where we've got our attendances, we've got our date field, uh, our increase, our decrease is our improvement direction. But this time we're going to add in a facet field. I'm sure we probably touched on facets in the sort of introduction course, and you may have had a go at them previously. But basically, we're going to create a separate plot for for each of the different types. So if we run that one through. Uh, it's now given us, uh, there we go. We've got a different plot per for ones, twos, and others, although they are a bit messy. Are we using data or data SPC? I am using data SPC. I oh, know, sorry. Sorry, Simon, that wasn't for you. It was for a uh, oh, right, question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm getting error, duplicate rows found in period. Yeah, no, you're right. That's probably because you haven't run this bit and that's what we're working off of. So, I mean, it's good. It's a start, but I think as it says here, it does look pretty, pretty clumpy. So let's uh, feed this uh, data 
uh, plot the dot state uh, object into an object. So basically just assign it to uh, a plot SBC here. And then what we can do is feed our plot SPC into a plot the dots create GG plot. And that basically takes our plot and turns it into a GG, a much nicer GG plot. And it allows us to tweak a whole bunch of things in there. So if we take that and run that one now, let's have a look at that and zoom through. So just by a couple of lines. First of all, I've I've tidied up the um, dates and and put them into a much nicer format. So a they're they're kind of much nicer to read. Um, I've rescaled each of the graphs, which pros and cons depending on what you're doing, uh, without a doubt. Um, which is you know that's definitely it. there are pros and cons and merits around whether you want to see the scale or whether you want to see that difference. Um, but now, obviously, it's created sort of free charts, and they are much, much more readable out of just changing a few tweaks of code. So that's great. Um, so we're going over to you. So let's add some more, make it look a little bit even prettier. So we want to create a faceted plot for type one attendances across those three, um, whatever they're called, organization codes. We want to change the point size of our plots to be a bit smaller because personally, I think they're a bit, again, a bit, a bit clumpy. We want to change the X axis label to say date rather than period. And also make any, oh, let's skip the bonus points because that's just a bit cheeky. Uh, let's make any other changes that you feel will, which would be helpful describe uh, the, the chart. And if you just want to change the name of the chart, again, that would probably be a, a good thing to have a go at. So that will be right back to the start. So you've got to make sure that you've pulled through the right data is your first bit that you want to pull through is uh, take the right cut of the data to start with, then feed it into an SPC object and then turn that SPC object into the plot, the create plot, that GG plot. And then within this, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can tweak and and uh, amend to make it look prettier. That makes sense. I hope so. Uh, and just to know that when you create that GG plot, it does just work as any GG plot. So if you then want to add other stuff to it, as you would with a GG plot, you are more than capable. You know, it allows you to do so. Um, whether you should or not, that's obviously debatable, but you can then you know add other things to it if, if you so wished. Um, things like annotations and that are really, really cool. So if you wanted to sort of annotate a specific point and say, look here, this is where it all went wrong, or or something along those sort of lines, uh, that's that's a really good thing to be able to do. Uh, they are currently working on a plot lee version of uh SBC. Uh, the plot the dots thing uh thing uh package where it has these charts and they have much more sort of hover over facilities it use they're gonna use the proper SPC icons and various bits and pieces to to make it all much much nicer and within plotly for those who have used plotly before so where are we over to you let me let me see what we've got so we've got that bit we've got that bit got that.
So uh, we want type one attendances for those three areas, which is that. We then want to feed it into our plot SPC, later SPC. Uh, but facet field this time is going to be organization code, not type. And then we've got a whole load of features that we wanted to potentially mess about with. Uh, point size is two. Let's change that. Main title Ooh. equals Simon's SPC plot. Uh, what else are we doing? X axis label X axis label equals uh, is it date? What I said it should be. Uh, any other things that might look nice? Uh, So let's run that free and see what we can avoid. Uh, little icons a bit over the thing there. So maybe let's move that I think there's an option for that. And for that to help icon position. Icon. Position equals top half on equal big up anything that we like. There. So uh, what's this telling us? Uh, it's telling us we made a little plot. Look at that. So obviously we can see they're all increasing. Uh, this guy here, the current data point is outside of our limits. So we're going to say, yikes, something's going on there. Uh, the other thing that SPC does is try to identify trends. So if we see that, again, going back to our walking to work example, if we saw that uh, for six six days in a row that your average time was 12 minutes rather than 10 minutes, we would go, oh, maybe something's shifted. Something sounds right. So there's certain rules around runs of data. So if we get six points above the mean, then we would say that that was a trend and we would say that was increasing. Uh, so that's what these yellow dots mean. And I say it does all of those sort of coloring in, in for you. And we're saying that this, uh, we've got high, high um, concern here because we've got a high value that is outside of our control limits and something is, is worrying here. Whereas this one, our current value is within our control limits. So we're just saying it's common cause variation, even though it's been, has been going up historically. Uh, anyway. If you want to go and learn how to interpret SPC charts properly, go and have a look at making data count. Uh, I will happily share a link when I send out my stuff at the end. Cool. Um, did we get our SPCs working okay? Everybody got something sort of pretty-ish and good? Righty-ho. Oh my goodness me, where are we? Basic functional programming. Uh, Probably a good time to go and have a break and uh, clear your brain cells. Um, I'm going to have some milkshake because my throat's hurting. So <laughs> let's have a quick 10 minute break till, uh, let's say, quarter two, quarter three. Um, and then we will do some basic functions. Uh, unless there's any questions on SPC before I uh, shoot off for two seconds. No. Cool. All right. Let's come back at quarter two. Thank you.
Sorry, Simon, are you there? Hmm. You're stuck on mute. Um. Can you unmute yourself now? That it. There we go. Sorry. Oh. It was me. So it doesn't let you unmute until you say I'm okay with it being recorded. Okay. Which is weird. Oh well, know that now. <laughs> Every day is a school day. Cool. Uh right. Has everybody else not got horribly muted and stuck? Narayan, are you back in the room? I you saw you sorry, I saw you just sent me a message. Uh, looks like everybody's back in. Yeah, cool. Excellent. Right. Uh, Sherry screen, Sherry screen. Where's that? Uh, that one there. Cool. We are on the home stretch. So uh, we're going to do some very, very quick, quick and dirty uh, functional programming. Uh, some of you guys might have done some of this before. Some of you might not. So... Apologies if it's too simple and apologies if it's too tricky. So I can't really win. Uh, so uh, base, basic functional variables, uh, basic functional variables, functional functions, basic functions. So we've all used functions all of the time, uh, all over the place. So every time you type a word and then do brackets, that's a function of, of some script, uh, description, whether that's your select statement, whether that's your read csv whether it's say your sys date whatever all of those all of them are functions but what we want to do is not have to repeat our code over and over and over again if we're doing the same sort of thing or we're doing the same sort of calculation um and we want to come up with our own function that does our own specific thing that we want to do many many times so let's just start uh, really simple. We're going to create some variables here, x, y, and z. And they're going to have values of 5, 10, and 15. Say we wanted, for whatever reason, to times those variables by 3. So we could do uh, x times 3. We could do y times 3, and we could do z times 3. And obviously, that will come out with our answers. That's great, uh, but that's just going to take us a, a long sort of time. Um, we could also uh, create a new a new variable uh, called x mult, which is our x times 3. And then uh, once we've got our... our new variable here we can see that our answer is is 15. that's great but you know if we have to repeat that over and over and over and over again it becomes an absolute nightmare so let's build a function uh and make that all good so what we want to do is create a function and it will do our calculations for us so we want to create a function called times three and the times three is going to be a function. And then the input for the function is going to be whatever input we're going to call a, a call, call a variable called input. And then our return will be whatever our input is times three. So if we run that, we now have a new function called times three, and we can put anything into it so we can put our x into it which is our five from up here 
and we can run that and it will give an answer of 15. We can put our Y into it and it should give us our answer of 30. Or we can do times three and we can think of any number it would want. So we can put 11 in there and that will come out with the answer of 33. So it will basically take whatever you chuck in there and, and spit something out, which is really, really super clever. Obviously, timesing things by three probably isn't the use case that we're, we're looking at. So um, let me see, where am I going to wobble onto now? So really, really interesting. Uh, and that doesn't mention this. So let's have a look at doing it a little bit more cleverly, as it were. Um, so very, very interesting. And we'll, we'll talk about scope in a second. So we're going to do... We're going to take our times three and we're going to make it a little bit more clever. So we're going to create a function called x times y. And this is going to take two numbers. I know this is getting crazy. And times whatever our first one is by our second one. Uh, and then print out a string uh, with our result. So not just uh, a, a calculation. It's also going to print out our result. So we're going to have x times y. I'm going to feed it five and four, fastest fingers first, and then it, there we go. It will say the answer is 20, and it will return a string of the answer is 20. So if you remember way, 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 way back uh, when we were doing, talking about scopes, uh, which was kind of interesting. So I talked about curly brackets and, and scopes um, very, very briefly. So the scope of a function is a bit weird in that it, a function will only return one thing and what happens in a function stays in a function. So they use Vegas rules is the best way to remember it. So if you can look here, I've got my X times Y and I've got my X and my Y and I could literally feed in my variables X and Y here if I wanted to. So let's just do that. Uh, and it would say my answer was 50. However, these this X and Y is not referring to these variables. It's referring to a, a figurative X and Y. And as you can see, within my function, within my scope of my curly brackets, I've created a variable called result. And the result is X times Y. However, and this is the big, big, big however, that result does not exist as a variable. So if we look in our values here, it does not exist. It does not exist in the global environment. It only exists within the scope of that function. So say for instance, uh, we've got our variable A here. I wanted to, you remember when we were doing, I can't remember what we were doing, we were doing uh, if statements. And I changed uh, the value of B to be A and all of that kind of malarkey. So let me just change my b to be 50 within my function uh, and then i run that uh sorry that's confusing because that's 50 as well let's just change that to 150 just so we know it's uh, doing something completely different and then we look back up here to our values this b here of that is 150 does not exist, has not changed the value in the global environment. And if I do, and uh, and B is, and I add in B to there, and I run that, there we go. The answer is 50, and B is 150. So it's referring to this B, that exists within the scope. This variable result exists within the scope. It does not exist in the global environment. And it will own it. And as I say, so it's very, very important to try to get your head around what, what happens in the function stays in the function apart from whatever you return. So if I wanted to, I could make it so that my function, you can, you can assign that to a, a, a variable. So I can make my variable uh, x times uh, is the answer to that. And if I call my variable, 
print it out, it will do that. And now you can see up here, I have got a variable called the answer is 50 and B is 150. So, oh, look at this, a function, a fun function, a function will only return one thing. And I've been a good boy here and I have used the return function within my function to absolutely specify what it is that I'm returning. You don't have to use that. By default, uh, R will simply uh, return the last thing. So if I if, if I run this uh, and I and I run it, so x times y no returns, and then I run it, it will still do my answer is is twenty five. It will be my result. Uh, so there. So getting back to our curly brackets, like I say, that's that's the scope, and very very important that that doesn't doesn't affect the global environment at all in any shape or form, uh, which is kind of what that says. So where are we? Uh, there we go. So yeah, just another example. We're going to create a variable called test, and that's going to have the value of monkey, and then again, like I've said here. I'm going to try to change the value of my test variable and change it to moo. Uh, but when I run it, we can have a look and we can still see the answer is 20. But when I look up at here at test, test is still monkey. It has not changed to moo. Uh, but however, if I put my test into my result where it will say the answer is moo because that moo test exists within the environment and it can return it there. Does that sort of make sense? Because uh, it took me a long time to get, to get my head around that. Um, yeah, it will become apparent the more times you use it. What is good to know, and I'd say we will come up to some fabulous use cases in a minute, that creating those functions is really, really powerful. And it means that you can do some really, really nice things. So you can do multiple things within a function. So all that wrangling we did earlier to change that hospital name into a short name, we could just change that into a function and say shorten hospital name. And then we could feed that into our pipeline and we could do mutate new hospital name equals shorten hospital name. And it would just shorten the hospital name and give us an output that without having to go through each of those steps each time, uh, which would obviously make things much easier. So that's it. This is going to add in multiple steps. So we're going to do a very strange uh, thing here. Um, we are going to add what we're going to do. We're going to take our X and our Y. And then depending on what date we run this function, we're either going to add 10 to the result or not add 10 to the result, which is a bit random. Um, but there you go. It's just to show that you can really do multiple steps. So we're going to take a, a new function, which is i y times x plus 10, maybe on the date. So we're still going to take in two variables, which will be our x and our y. Our result is just going to be x times y. Our day of the month, we're just going to take today's date and pull out the day of it. And if, it, and if it's greater than the 15th, we're going to add 10 to the result. Otherwise, we're just going to return the result. Whew, that's a bit of a crazy old one. So, so without running it, uh, and without running this bit, pop in the chat what is going to be the answer of that function. Pass those fingers first. What answer is it going to give us? Well, 30 dairy, fastest thing there. 30 for 30 question mark. Definitely not going to give us a question mark at the end. I'm going to be decisive. Uh, so. 30, 30, 30, 30, all pretty 
good so let's have a look and see if you are right that's probably the best thing to do is uncomment that bad boy and look at that you are indeed correct so uh that's brilliant uh Functions can get pretty convoluted pretty quickly and can be hard to read, which is why it is good practice to write doc strings for functions. So a bit like when we were using other people's functions, which is like the plot the dots function, or we were using, um, uh, uh, so I'm trying to remember what else we were looking at earlier. We were using other functions and then we were pressing F1 and we were seeing what features that function can take. Um, because it had a really nice sort of like readme and vignette to go along with that function, which is brilliant. Um, you know, obviously without that, you wouldn't know what would go into that function. So, you know, really, really good thing. So doc string is like a shortened version of that. So we're not expecting you to write a full vignette around what's what's going on. However, it is good practice to write doc strings for your functions because Believe me, future you or somebody else reading your code is massively going to thank you um, around what, what your code is doing. And especially if you've created some much, much more complicated function uh, around that. So where is, oh, where are we going? Backing up session. I think my computer's gone to sleep again. Am I breaking up at all? Is it okay? That's my... Uh, okay. All good. Oh, Elsie's entered the waiting room again. Oh. What is going on here? I'm just getting strange stuff happening. Sorry, it seems to be throwing a little bit of a wobble for me at the moment. No, it's still not happy. I'm just going to do a refresh and see if that helps. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. So duck strings, um, real pain in the neck to write. Be really, really helpful for, like I say, for future you. And massive, massive, uh, I'll just, I'll, if I get two minutes at the end, without a doubt, Google Gemini or any other large language model of your... Um, choice is fantastic at writing doc strings <laughs> for you uh, and i thoroughly recommending using large language models to write doc strings for you so uh i i fully fully condone that so i've got my x times 10 function here but i've just written here a, a very full-on proper example of what a full doc string for this uh, function would go. You don't necessarily have to go down fully down this this rabbit hole of going this strong, but um, just like a very quick overview of what the function does is is really really helpful because again you'll find you'll write this function and then you'll use it in a piece of code like a couple of hundred lines further down. And if you just jump to that in a couple of months' time, you go, well, what does this function do? I can't remember. It does all these things. If you've just got a very, very quick example there, this function multiplies two numbers, X and Y, as sends a result if the current day of the month is greater than 15, otherwise it simply returns the product of X and Y. Fabulous. Um, if you can give it some more examples of like what the parameters are, as in whether it's expecting a, a numeric number, whether it's expecting a data frame, whether it's expecting... a vector you know what 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 are the parameters that you're feeding into it and then also a bit of a description of what what it's going to return and even more so if you want to be absolutely amazing you can add in some examples of this is what it would look like if you ran it on the 10th of the month and this is what it would look like if you ran it on the 20th of the month say for instance and give some some working examples what you can also do, and let's say it's a massive rabbit hole if you want to get into really good functional programming, is create unit tests where 
if somebody feeds in a character string into this function, it will come up with an error, but it will give you an appropriate, you know, a really nice error message, which will tell you how to fix it. Like, oopsie, you've put a number, uh, a character in here where, it, it, you know, we're looking for a number or, or something along those lines. Maybe not oopsie, that's... Uh, uh, but you know what I mean. Um, so you can give it a really descriptive error message. You can make it so that it checks that everything is is sound and do all that kind of stuff. So let's say that's that's a way we can add a really nice doc string to something. And let's say future you uh, would be would be awesome. So over to you. So we want to tweak the of the above function so that instead of times the first two input, so it does. Yeah, instead of just doing the times by the first two inputs and adding 10 to the result, it, uh, what does it do? It adds, oh, instead of just 10, it adds the num a number that you specify. So it's just adding another variable to the, uh, to the function. And you don't have to write the doc string. That's homework, I'm sure. Uh, and for bonus points, assign your result to a variable. So I think I did show you how to do that just now. It's the same as you would assign anything to a, a, a variable. Even better if you spell variable right mm, like that here. Oops. Yeah. Ah, okay, let's do that bit first. Okay. Oh no, that's right. Cool. So uh, to do that, basically, we've added another another variable that goes into our function. We can call those variables whatever we want, and it's again a good idea not just call them x and y. Um, give them something useful so that you can see where they fit into your your function further on so yes i've got my x and y which we were sort of adding uh sorry multiplying and then i've got my add here which i've changed my bit here so instead of just uh adding a straight plus 10 it's now adding my add uh so that will run it so it'll be four times one it's not past the 15th of the month so uh, uh, my answer is going to be four. Obviously, if it had been the 16th for a mark greater, my answer would be uh, 19. And then if I want to assign, assign that to a variable, I can obviously do my, my variable there. So that's great. Um, hopefully you got something like that. Let's say we can use our functions in, in a data frame, uh, you know, and we can use our functions same as we can use any other function once we've created it in, in any shape or form. So let's just take our data fun, uh, which is just going to be a, uh, a cut down version of uh, free organizations and type ones and remove our breaches. And I'm going to create a new column. Uh, which is good grief. Uh, going to create a new column, which is going to be my attend times admissions, no, attendances times admissions, and maybe add plus 10, uh, depending on what data is, obviously. Uh, so that's a really stupid uh, name. And obviously, look at me, I've gone way over this line, and there's a good reason why we don't do uh, stupidly long uh, titles there. 
So I'm going to feed in my function. So this is my function here, which is my x times x times y plus 10 date. And I'm going to run that on my admissions and my uh, sorry, attendances and my admissions. So my attendances is going to fit into the x and my admissions is going to feed into the y. So if I run that one and where have I got add? Oh, because I've changed that one, haven't I? Uh, no, I want to use... Sorry, I changed my function and I didn't rename it because that's very naughty. Let's go back and run that one now. There we go. So now when I look at my data function, I've got this amazingly stupid column now, which is my attendances times my admissions but without a plus 10 because it's less than the 15th of the month or whatever. But as you can see, I've created a function and I've now managed to feed it into a data frame uh, to do something weird and convoluted. So had it been a 16th or above, then all these numbers would be 10. And like I say, you can, I don't know, you could make it so that it would take in the uh, attendance type. And if it was a type two, instead of timesing it, it would divide it or if it was a type three then it would add them rather than times them and you can do all of that kind of malarkey if, if you so want you know that's the beauty of building those functions is that you kind of create that function to do that thing and then you don't have to repeat that process again and again and again and if you want to apply it to separate data frames that's that's really good um let's say it's a really silly example but hopefully it gives you an example of what can be done I use uh, a function loads for things like calculating rates per 10,000 uh, or, or 100,000 sort of population rates and things like that, where I just want to feed in a number, compare it to what my ICB rate is, uh, my ICB is, and then do a calculation based on based on that. Um, and just kind of, I've got some functions which just do that for me because it's something I do again and again and again. I get really bored of having to do the lookups and... Uh, all of that kind of malarkey. So that's all good. Uh, so my goodness me, this is one of those really horrible examples. I want you guys to create me a function that uh, creates the mean of three numbers, but without using the mean function, um, which is obviously very mean. How many times can I use the mean word mean to be mean? For extra credit, uh, can you create a function that calculates the mean over any set of numbers? So regardless of how many numbers you put in, it will give you the mean of those numbers. So start off with three and then see if you can do it so that it does any. So, yeah. So hopefully you'll get to understand how how clever some of the functions under the hood are in, in base R. And, you know, that is generally how they are how they are written. So, cool. Uh, there we go. So, yeah, have a go at that. Write me a mean function. And don't just call it mean. Call it mean function or something. Otherwise, uh, that's where you start getting into conflicts. We don't mean that. So, yeah, I appreciate we're at quarter past three now, and uh, you've, you've had all day of me. So if anybody comes up with the extra credit answer and thinks they've got it, please put a yay in the chat and you win the prize for creating the mean function. And genuinely, there is a prize. Let me know and I will post it out to you. Who says we can't do competitive training?
you know. I can see Susie is pressing those buttons extra hard now, and I've mentioned competitiveness and prizes. So it's a bit of a cheeky question. And the hardest bit is the any set of numbers. So how would you feed in any set of numbers rather than, as we have been doing very specific, the free numbers, which requires a tiny bit of lateral thinking. Something we haven't strictly covered yet. Ish, although it's something you are probably aware of, you just think. Uh, I think we're all muted by the host, so can't unmute. Ah, I see. Okay, but you screaming at me. Um, let me see. I've got the power to unmute everybody without destroying everything. Um, I don't think I maybe I'd... just change the setting for that. I think yeah. Bianca might do it on. I don't think I've got the power. Yeah, it's been unmuted now. Okay. That's excellent. Okay. Anybody got it? I don't. I don't have it. So. <laughs> As competitive as I am. Then we want, I'll give you a clue, all right? I'll pop it up on the screen. Clue. <laughs> okay. No problem, Annabelle. I mean, as far as I know, the recording should be available and yet yeah, the last few bits will be on the GitHub. I will share that. Uh, now you use... Uh, close. You use the mean function, though, Narayan. The whole point is not to use the mean function. We'll do it on our fingers. But you've got got one of the bits for sure, which is the length num, which is the that's the tricky bit. Should put you out of your misery. It looks like I get the prize. And you'll kick yourself when you see it. I'm 
ठीक है so that's pretty much it so i'm going to uh, create a vector that was that was the tricky bit is feeding a vector into your function so again you're not limited to individual things we can feed a a, a vector into it run my mean function and then I can do my mean function on, I can do it on my vector of x. Uh, well, I need to actually return that. Uh, well, it's not actually, yeah. Why is that? There we go, 6.5. Let's do print. Let's print mean. Let's add that in there. 6.5. Let's just try another couple of things. So one, two, three, four. Uh, which let's do uh, five. So the average of that should be three. Ooh. Oh, stupid boy. So yeah, I've got to feed that in as a vector. And there we go. That we get uh, an answer of three. So the 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 trick was. Uh oh, there we go. What have we got here? Me, mean of numbers function. Oh my goodness, me. Mm -hmm. uh, list mean is uh, but I, oh my good grief. Uh yes, I mean that works. I think, <laughs> but like yikes, that's uh that's that's very convoluted. <laughs> I like it though. All right, Maisie, you sort of get the prize. Give me the give me your address at the end, and I will send you a prize. I think my my version is a lot easier. Yours is easily. We haven't done loops yet. Loops is what we're doing next. So you're like jumping ahead and cheating. But anyway, you do win because it did work, and we don't care if it is is sweet. Anyway, so the the trick was for sure. Um, uh is is that we can feed in a a vector to it um so let's just run it bit by bit so we've got a vector which is these numbers here we can just do our sum of x which will just add all those together and then we can do our uh, length of x lengthy of x which will tell us that there are four uh things in our vector and then obviously one divided by the other will give us our arithmetic mean. Cool. Oh my goodness me. Doing means is really mean. So yes, excellent. Good, good. Uh, right. So uh, functions are not just for data functions. So we can set the result of a function to be a plot, for instance. So say we had our lovely SPC chart set up the way we wanted to, and we just wanted to tweak the sight of it. So we've, we've got uh, a bit more of a convoluted uh, area here. So we've got our plot site, and we want to plot a site across our data, and we want to create a faceted plot by um, the, the type, uh, the one, two, and other, but for whichever site that we specify. So let's just have a look how this works. We're going to create a plot site, and it's going to be a function. And all it's going to take in is our site ID. We're then going to feed our site ID, and we're just going to filter our data down to our site. Everything else is just creating that plot object. So if we just run that, and then we can just run it against a plot, uh, a, a site. And as you can see here, it just spits out uh, a, a a plot for whichever site we we choose, and you can just pick whatever one you want. So if we go back to our lovely data, pick a random. I'm just going to scroll down a bit. Yeah, in the middle, about there, uh, RBZ, and then go here. Ooh. Plot RBZ. And there we go. It's created a plot for our RBZ. So again, really, really useful and amazing bit of power. So it's not just doing those sort of calculations or, or whatever. 
if I want to write a function that creates a plot, you know, and I'm creating those same sort of plots over and over and over again, I can put that into a function. And as you can see here, I've now got a nice function which plots uh, to, to a site, uh, which is which is really awesome. Um, so, you know, I can literally just pick whatever site I want, feed it into that function, and I don't have to copy all this code over and over again. If I decide that I want to, I don't know, literally, oh, I don't like the size of my dots, or God, they're too blobby again, I just have to change it in one place in the function, and it will just change globally because it's all working off the same thing rather than having to go to each and every single instance of, of whatever it is I've done. So again, really, really useful. So that same uh, that same very thing here, uh, I've chucked through uh, um, oh, just adding some extra good practice here. So good practice uh, not to call on anything outside of the function. So in this instance, we are calling on we're we're feeding in the site but we're calling in the data which fits outside of the function. Um, so you can't, the, the function can read outside, but what it can't do is affect outside. Because I talked about that scope thing earlier. So it can see the outside global environment and it can, can pull things from there, but it's a good idea to keep your scope completely self-contained so that it, isn't interacting with the global environment in any way um, because it will yeah it can cause 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 issues. So what is good practice is even though we're pulling the site in as a, a variable, we're also going to call we're going to have our data frame which is going to be our data. So we're also going to call our data into our function. It also means if we're really, really nice and we've got this plot working and it's a fantastic plot or it's a fantastic piece of analysis and we want to take that plot and we want to apply it to something else, uh, a different data set or a different thing, um, we can then lift and shift that and we don't have to, it's not hard coded that it's looking for that very specific piece of data. If, for instance, like we were doing earlier, we were doing a whole load of convoluted things, and we're, as you can see here, I've got 500 different versions of the data. I could make this function work across not just this main data set, I could make it look, work on one of these other data sets, um, assuming that you know something uh, fundamental had changed within them. So bringing that in is is really good. And also, if you want to, you can set like a default to the, the to the um, to the function. So if, for instance, I wanted RJ1 as my absolute default uh, for this function. So no matter what, by default, it's going to produce a plot for RJ1. And we run that. And then I just run my plot site and don't feed anything through to it. It's going to just plot uh, RJ1 for me because that's what I've set as a default. Only if I change it, will it uh, well, if I put that first thing in there, will it then go to a different one? So again, putting a default into your plots also means that, or, or your function means they probably don't fall over, which is which is really good. Um, I have added in here just because I'm a, a really good boy. Um, a uh, ooh, that's that's wrong. Plot the dots. I should say plot the dots. Uh, so, uh, again, I use AI generated, very naughty. Uh, so this is AI generated doc string for my function. Uh, I, again, that's how I'll show you at the end how to do that in a minute. Um, but basically it's just showing you what's, what's it's doing. This function generates a plot the dots, ggplot for a specific site based on attendance data, utilizes predefined functions like plot the dot, blah, blah, blah and then tells you what the function does, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, just adding a little doc string to explain what your function is doing is awesome. So that's functions in a nutshell. Uh, what we're gonna do now, and look at this, we're very near the bottom, so we're doing good, is some simple for loops. So loops are much more of a sort of programmatic uh, way of doing things. 
Uh, for loops are not necessarily the best uh, way of doing things, but they are very easy and they are very readable. Um, there are other packages which do similar things. Uh, if you ever look into like the per package, um, which uses vectorization, which does loops, but a lot faster. Um, loops are pretty slow and quite computing intensive if you've got big data sets and trying to do complicated things. So a lot of snooty people will look down their nose at you and say, oh, you're using loops and you're using for loops. Um, but stuff them if it works for you and, you know, it just means it's taking an extra couple of minutes to run. I'm not going to tell on you. So it's all good. So let's a look at what a loop can do. So basically a loop is something where it iterates through a, a list a number of times and changes a variable based on your iteration. So if, for instance, you want to do the same thing several times, but with a slightly different iteration or a uh, a different, how can I explain it, a different variable in, in essence, uh, this is how you can do it. So if you've got a really convoluted process and you want to do it, over and over and over again this is a, a a way of doing it so let's just do something super simple so we're going to start off with the sequence function or the sec function uh if we run that whoops let's just get rid of my plot site sequence one to ten will give me a sequence of numbers between one and ten uh which is super helpful um and what we want to do is create a loop which will take each of those numbers in turn and add five to it and print the result. So not, not the most uh, exciting loop in the world. And without a doubt, there's you know simpler ways of doing this. Uh, but we want to do each result come through individually um, and just get each result one at a time and and give us a result so again we've got this for i in sec so for i is basically our variable so i guess for loops look, work a little bit like a uh, a function in that we're going to have this variable and it's going to change and it's going to be the first time we run through it the 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 value of i is going to be one the second time we run it it's going to be two etc it's going to go through and iterate through the things in our list. Um, and basically what we then create is some more curly brackets. So again, we're creating a, another sort of mini scope. And within our scope, our I is gonna change. It's gonna run through, it's gonna do all the things within our scope. Once it's finished, it's gonna go back up to the start of our full statement and then go on to the next thing in our iteration. So. Our I will be one, it will run through, we will calculate what uh, one plus five is, and we will paste the result. One plus five equals, and we'll find out what the result is, no spoilers, um, and it will then print the result. It will then go through and it will change I to be two, and it will then work out what two plus five is, again, no spoilers, and then it will create the result and then print that out, et cetera, et cetera. So if we run this, uh, let me just move this one up a bit. As you can see, it's just iterated through and we've got 10 different results. And it's obviously the first time it ran through, I was one, the second time it was two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I think I've sort of uh, explained curly brackets and scope. So uh, a for loop does affect the global environment and does get impacted uh, around what's going on. So if we look at our uh, variable i, we do have a variable i, it does exist. Um, and it is currently, if we just literally look at it, i is 10 because each time we iterated through the iterations, I'm not sure that's the right thing. It's changed and it's overwritten what I is. And obviously the last thing that I was was 10. So that's what it is. We also have a variable called result, which is what was created here. And that exists. That's a, a real thing within our global environment. And again, because we iterated through it and we overwrote it each time, 
the latest one is what that result is. Likewise, with our i plus 5, the last thing it went through is that the um, uh, is, is the i plus 5. So there are some issues with with uh, sort of doing loops like this in that it will give us those sort of 10 results, but how we capture them and what we do with them gets, gets a little bit tricky and uh, we will sort out how to do that. Some of the really nice things that we could do is things like the column bind, so the row bind that we did earlier. So what we could do is run some analysis and then bind on the bottom of whatever data frame is the results of our first iteration and then take that and then bind the new uh, iteration on the bottom and then bind it on the bottom and then bind it on the bottom. So again, that's a way of, sort of appending data within a loop to get one result uh, at the at the end. Because as I said, by default, it will just sort of like overwrite whatever we're doing each time unless we sort of uh, bind it or, or work out a funkier way of, uh, of putting stuff through, which I will come to in a bit. So let's come up with a, a weirder sequence um, and, and look at what that does. So we're going to look at um, N row data. Uh, let's just pull that bit out and have a look. So we've got data, N row, hopefully uh, you'll be able to guess, give us the numbers of rows in our data set. So if we go back up here, this is our 12,000. 765 observations and so we're going to create a new sequence which starts at 50 ends at 12,765 and goes up by increments of 500 which is a little bit insane but let's just have a quick look at what that looks like there we go it's it's done that so sequence is a really fabulous muchly underused um uh uh command Really, good. I've used it for creating like directions to, uh, um, like if we've got a target and we're here and our target's up there, what's like the monthly sequence that we would need to get to get to that target? So, can we pull month by month where we need to get to rather than just drawing a straight line? You can use like sequence to. to to pull that through um, and and do things like that, so you can tell it how many iterations you want as well. So you, so for instance, I've said I want um, start at start at fifty, go up to twelve hundred, and go up by increments of five hundred. I can also say I want to start at fifty, go up to twelve hundred, but I want to go up in seventeen equal steps. It would then work out what those seventeen equal steps are and give you that sequence of numbers of whatever crazy uh, thing that would be. Let's just not go there. Anyway, so um, like I say, you can do some really, really uh, interesting uh, things with, with the sequence thing. So you're not sort of limited sort of one to 10. Another uh, really, really powerful thing is that our, we can iterate over vectors. So iterated over a sequence kind of makes sense. We can do one to 10. What's really powerful is we can create a vector and iterate over a vector. So we've got a vector now, and our vector are the names Bob, Pete, and Mary. And obviously they're in a vector, they're separate things. We can now do for an I in vector, and our result will be hello, I, print result. So in our first loop, our I will be the first item in our vector, which will be Bob, so we'll say hello, Bob. Then we'll loop round and then it will say uh, hello Pete and then it will loop round and go to the next bit of the vector and say hello Mary. So let's have a look at that. See, massive spoilers told you what it was going to do already. Um, but, um, you know, that's that becomes really, really quite powerful because then if I want to run my same function that I've done across a bunch of ICBs or a bunch of teams or or something that gets quite quite crazy. So let's have a look at this. So um, what we're going to do is use a list. I'm not going to go massively into what a list is, um, but let's just say it's a container that we are going to put a load of plots into. Um, so we're going to create a list. So lists are an amazingly magical, powerful 
way of making multi-dimensional data frames and things is probably the easiest way to um <laughs> to not to describe them very well so basically a list is pretty much as it says it's a list of stuff and you can put a bunch of stuff into a list you can put a data frame into a list and then another data frame into a list and so basically we could go back to our global environment here and put all of our data separate data frames into a list so we could have this is our first bit of our list is this data frame the next bit of our list is this bit etc cetera, etc cetera. and so you can create these crazy multi-dimensional magic um lists um which you can do some really amazingly clever things on but let's not worry about that now let's do a really naughty practice and just create ourselves an empty list which is going to be a plot list and it's going to be a list of zero because we've got nothing in it but what we want to do is create a vector sorry about the old spelling i need to go and uh also check on my spelling i'm going to create a vector and i am going to create a vector of three of my different sites and what i'm then also going to do is now I want to iterate through my three sites and in my plot list at position i i want to do a plot site of my i so the first time i run it it will be plot site i which means I will do plot site I of RQM and it will create this plot for me. The next time it runs through and does an iteration, it's going to do an RJ1. And the next iteration, it's going to do RDD. So I'm going to have one object, which is my plot list, and it's going to contain three plots, which mind blowing. Uh, so let's have a look at what that looks like. So let's run that. And it's given me a bunch of warnings. Don't worry about that. That's, um, yeah. So, so I've done really bad list practice, but it's just given me some warning messages. So now it doesn't look like I've got anything exciting apart from when I look in my plot list now, it says list of three. So apparently I've got three things in my list. So let's have a look at my plot list for RQM. And if I run that and I pull that out from my list, as you can see, I have got a plot for my RQM in my list. Oh, and I've also got an RJ1. So let's see if I can pull that out of my plot list. And there we go. It's uh, RQ1. And as I'm sure you can imagine, I could also pull out RDD. I can also... Uh, call from the position in the list so if i just want the first thing in the list i can run that and as you can see that changes as well you can have a look at the plot list object and that will tell you a sort of hierarchy of what's in that data frame so we can see that our plot list it's got three levels of things in it and then within that it's got separate things so for instance, this has got a list of lists, and in there is the all the gubbins which goes into the GT plot, which is what all this 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 tibble nonsense is. Uh, but you can see at this level, this is the bit we're interested in. This area here, we can see we've got three things within our list, and uh, we can pull that through. If we wanted to, we could do uh, something clever, going back to our unique, which we we. Uh, we're looking at this morning and we can create a vector of all of our uh a unique vector of all of our different uh sites if we so wished and if we really wanted to we could iterate across that vector um and basically it would then run that plot list uh function across each and every site and then put them all in one massive long list of uh, almost 300, 274 uh, plots within a single object. And then we could call them as we wanted to. So if we wanted to put them in different parts of a, of a report, we could. I don't recommend that you, <laughs> you run that because uh, it will take some time. And uh, some of us want to go home, even though we are already home. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, that would create a, a massive list of stuff. Um, where are we? I think, my goodness me, is that pretty much it? Wow, uh, 
well we quarter to four so all good all good so yes kind of made it to the end um like i said we don't really want to run that let me just show you very very quickly uh my mate gemini and how to write a doc string uh or how to get gemini to write a doc string is probably fairer so we've got a we've got a plot there we go there we go let's go there and uh, we want to go to my mate Gemini, if you're not signed up already, I think you just log in with your normal um uh your normal uh blah, 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 Google account. Say hi Gemini, please write me a dot string for this R code. And then just paste it in, press return and sit back as the magic happens. There we go. Ta -da. So I would thoroughly recommend um, using things like Gemini to, to help uh, uh, your coding. Uh, you can, obviously you can ask Gemini to do your coding for you, but I definitely wouldn't recommend that because it's, it's a bit rubbish. What it is fabulous at doing is commenting code. So if you've written a bunch of code it will, you can ask it to comment it and it will tell you what's going on. It's really good if you've got somebody else's code and you ask it to comment it because it will obviously read the functions and give you comments around uh, uh, what's what's going on, um, which is, again, really, really useful. Obviously, never, ever put any sort of patient data or any data into uh, Gemini. We're just looking at sort of code. So, you know, don't put anything sort of hard coded in there or patient details, etc. But for just sort of uh, some of the admin -y side of things, um, thoroughly recommend the use of uh, AI while we, while we are still the overlords over it before it all takes over. And obviously always say please, because, you know, one day the robots will take over and they remember these things. Um, okay, we have got about, well, we're sort of half an hour or so. If there's any any other questions... I have got a few things which I need to cover off. Let me just pop the feedback form into the chat. If you would be so kind to fill that in, that would be really, really, really helpful. Um, but yeah, happy to sort of take any questions or queries or, or what to do next. Um, let's say part of the sort of why there are community we are looking uh, there are sort of see there are sort of more specific courses around making uh pretty graphs there are some courses around quarto and markdown and i'll send out some examples of some of the stuff i've done there i'm working on a course although i haven't got very far with it at the moment about how to make pretty tables so everybody's all about graphs but actually i think a pretty and a good table is just as powerful as a as a good graph. So uh, I'm I'm waving the flag for tables. Um, I also run a coffee and code session. So I'm not sure if you guys are aware of that. So that's every two weeks. It alternates between a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and it's basically an hour session where you can come ask questions. We do a bit of show and tell around what people are up to. At the moment, we're doing a, a bit of a series around how to use the government cookie cutter to um, make wrap processes. But we cover all sorts of things, so some you know really really clever stuff to you know what's Simon's useful or anybody's useful function of the week. So um, it sort of covers all all areas, um, and there's sort of various. We've got a futures page, and some of those are, are recorded, and there's some sort of repos and bits and pieces you can find there. Right, I would, um, yeah, happy to take any questions if anybody's got anything, or if there's anything we want to go back over, or or anything at all. You've got me. Yeah, a lot of the cool kids are using Quarto rather than um, pure Markdown these days, um, which is much nicer than um, Markdown. It's a bit of a culture shock if you're used to Markdown, but uh, it's it's much, much more powerful and you can make much better 
uh, moving stuff around and, and uh, arranging things is much, much easier in Forte. I've read some of the stuff I've read, Simon, uh, has been about uh, Core was more for collaboration. Um, is, is that... Is, is that... No. <laughs> okay, so it's just about Not at all. No, Quarto is just a, a newer version of Markdown. So it's virtually identical. Markdown will work in Quarto. Quarto's just got some extra bells and whistles which make doing like layouts and things uh much, much easier. So for instance, if you wanted to put a chart next to a chart or a chart next to some text quite a flaff in markdown absolutely doable but is a bit of a flaff whereas in quarto it's really really simple um and you don't need any sort of license to host things no, like... no, no, exactly the same so it's all part of the r studio so if you it's go like if you've got any recent ish version of r studio there should be as you used to have uh, an option for new file r markdown it's virtually identical you can just do quarto document the other really nice thing about Quarto is it does really nice presentations as well as standard. So if you use Markdown in the past and had to use like Zaragon slides or anything like that, Quarto just comes with it as standard. So you can make really, really nice slide decks really simply. Um, that was one of the questions for this course, actually, is... Obviously, I've designed it at the moment that it's like one big long script that you kind of run along and you sort of run bits and 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 sort of scroll through. The option was to have it as more of sort of a slide deck and sort of go through it and copy stuff from the slides and then run it. I don't know. Does it work as a big long messy script or is there too much gibberish? Do I need to get rid of some of the crap that I've written? I don't know. Do you put in the comments how you how you feel about that? You prefer the long R script. Good. Uh, yep. Uh, I think Annie has said there is there is an introduction to sort of quarto course, which is which is really good. Thoroughly recommend all that. Uh, got a run massively useful, easy to follow, no problem. Was there anything anybody wanted to cover that we didn't? I know it was it was very I appreciate it. it was very, very random and all over the place. I was just trying to think of as many, I don't know, analytical use cases as possible around the kind of stuff you do with data, a fair chunk and nice I don't know, state time saving ways of, of doing those sort of things. And appreciate we did cover a lot. So by all means, I will be sending out the links again and you can have a look. Oh, um, just in case you don't know, if you are using the uh, cloud, uh, which I know quite a lot of you are, if you want to save your script and download it, obviously save it. And there over here, you can go to more and you can do an export. Oh, sorry. You've got to actually pick a file and then click on more and export, and then it will allow you to actually download that file and you can use it however you want uh, in in the R instance of your choice. Yeah, per, per for iteration is, yeah, a bit more of another level, I think. That's the problem. Um, to be fair, I'm not an expert on pair, so um, I didn't really want to teach it. I can, I can just about struggle and get by. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't tend to do a lot of iterations. I guess occasionally, and when I do do them, a for loop is probably sufficient. Um, although I have done some funky map stuff in some, yeah, things. Uh, a bit more time with examples. Yeah, I mean, that's on you. Should have shouted, slow down. <laughs> but that's absolutely fine. <laughs> it's really hard to tell from this side. I hope you appreciate uh, yeah, how long things are taking. Um, so, you think the long script, not long script, good, good, good. 
blah, blah, blah. Training guidance, switching a quarto. Yeah, we can put some links onto that. Um, I've got a big shout out to my, I'll, I'll send it out in some follow up. Um, I'll do a follow up email with some details of where to get some links on that. I've got a good tutorial, sort of self contained tutorial. I guess similar to this, but for Quarto, so you can sort of see the examples and, and run through them. I'll share that. Pretty tables and graphs, um, accessibility rules. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good thing to, to to shout out that, you know, R does come with all the nice accessibility stuff and Quarto has got a lot of that built in. So if you want to put a, uh, a graph up and you also want to give it some alt text for um, screen readers or you want to put a table up and put alt text in there, Quarto comes up with that kind of stuff as standard, um, which ticks a lot of our really good accessibility things that we should be doing. Um, so, yeah, definitely shout out to that. Uh, da, 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 da. Thanks, Simon. Uh, no worries. Right. Nobody got anything otherwise than that. We will be at four o'clock. I'm going to go and get some fresh air and uh, stop talking. And you guys can stop listening. Fabulous. Thank you all so very much for coming. Please follow in the feedback. It's all appreciated. And we'll go to uh, hopefully make the course better for and everybody else, I'll send out some uh, a follow-up email. Tell all your friends about Coffee & Co. Do come along. Be part of the NHSL community. Keep up the good work and uh, catch you all soon. All right. Thank you very much. Cheers.